Good afternoon, world, and welcome to the Open Tech and Design Summit. My name is Geraldine DeBastian, and I am very proud to bring this program to you, which has been created by the Global Innovation Gathering and the Distributed Design Network of Europe. In this opening session, we want to say happy birthday, Republica. It's sometimes hard to believe it's been 15 years already, and also eight years of the Global Innovation Gathering. We want to take a look back to see how has Republica influenced the lives of people, what has changed in digital rights scenes across the world, and what are our hopes for the future. So for the opening session, I've invited three core members of the Gig Network that have been part of this journey to share some of their memories and also some of the things that they're currently working on. I would love to introduce to you now Sheila Bergen, who is currently at the CORD, where she's busy accelerating the African innovation system to be part of the global digital market. She's formerly the manager of the iHub and really one of the people who's been instrumental in elevating digital innovation in Kenya. I'd also warmly welcome Gabby Agostini, who is really the key person of the maker movement in Brazil and has been so instrumental in setting up events and setting up spaces and establishing communities around the maker movement, especially also in her function as the founder and CEO of Alabi. And thirdly, I would like to very warmly welcome Jay Fajardo, who is really one of the key digital entrepreneurs of the Philippines and has shaped the digital landscape of the country over the past decades. He's also the founder and CEO of Launch Garage, one of the key innovation hubs and incubators in the Philippines. It's lovely that you could all be with me today. Hi. Likewise. So let's start. I would love to begin by the question. Maybe you can take us back each to, yeah, what was your first Republica experience? And over the past years of having visited Republica as part of the gig community, what have been some of the things that you've taken away and have perhaps influenced you in your work life? Jay, would you I'll like to begin? First. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, well, um, I joined the um, gig or I, I, uh, I was at the first um, um, gig gathering in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, it's about eight years ago. So, um, and um, one of the things that really um, uh, struck out for me was that um, I come from a very technology um, heavy space and experience, um, tech entrepreneur, et cetera. But um, on my visits to Republica, I realized um, that um, the, the innovation pace of innovation and technology has to come hand in hand with a lot of social innovation as well. Um, and um, um, Republica is, a, is actually, um, you know, it's a, almost a sensory overload of, of different cultures, different experiences, different people and from all around the world and over the years it's it's just increased and and um exponentially uh um increased in 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 effect but um um like i said the takeaway for me was uh, bringing me um away from a pure technology perspective um more towards a, a balanced um balanced um uh, view of innovation, which heavily includes um, society and people and the different experiences of um, um, folks like Sheila, um, folks like Gabby in their own parts of the world. So it's all different. There's a lot of nuances. It's different for us in, in the Philippines and Southeast Asia as well. Um, and um, ever since the first year, I've always approached um, the work that I do um, with that in mind, um, in fact, um, uh, very heavily influenced by the importance of social innovation. That's super interesting to hear that that was just a different perspective on some of the topics that you had already been working on. Maybe looking at that aspect, just a quick follow-up question. Sometimes when I look back to that first gathering that we had in 2013, I feel like 
and so many things have changed fundamentally since then. And maybe we were a little bit naive, even in some ways, thinking about the ways that we could have technology impact our societies. Do you share that sentiment? And what are some of the things that you feel have really changed since then, both globally, but also in regard to the situation in the Philippines? Um, well, um, you're right about that. The, uh, the, um, the, um, the change in, in perspective personally was, was, was pretty much that it's, uh, I came in like with, a with a technology view of, uh, of, uh, Silicon Valley, you know, all that, uh, all that hype. Um, and I came out with much more, much more interest and, um, and, uh, respect of, uh, innovation in the grassroots, which for me is, a is, um, is one of the key drivers and motivations for what I've been doing over the years um, since then. Now, what has changed over the years in, um, in um, the macro perspective in the Philippines, for example, um, a lot has changed since, since 2013. Everybody knows what happened in 2016, the world, uh, the world drastically changed for a lot of people. Um, and um, I still remember we were at Republica um, on that um, on, in that year, and you could really feel how the winds of of how society was going to be uh, moving drastically changed. And we were it was it was sort of bleak. And I was talking. In fact, I was talking to uh, we we're talking about Chin Mai um, uh, just a while back, and we were together. We said, like, you know what? Uh, there's so many things that are about to change, and true enough, 2016 all the way to now, things have um, flipped. Things have maybe corrected in some places, but um, that whole naivete of the global citizen, the global uh, community, us being um, um, things moving to a different level, um, where everybody respects each other, the barriers are being broken down, culture, cultural. Uh, barriers and cultural um, respect were was was being elevated that that suddenly got flipped over. So that's what changed for me. That's yeah. one of the things that that, that I saw. Um, yeah, and at the same time, that's something we're looking at preserving or maybe reinventing in a way, at least within our communities and the powers that we have. Um, Gabby, I think. At least, I hope I remember correctly, All you and also Sheila have also been part of the very first time we had the Global Innovation Gathering at Republica back in 2013. So maybe take us back a little bit. I would also love to hear from your perspective. What have been some of the memories of the things that you took away that sort of influenced your work life? Gabby, may I pass it to you next? Hi, thank you. And... Um... I think I started, I think my first gig was the second one in 2014. I'm not sure. I was trying even to find here, but I think like I arrived a little bit later, but it's still like a time ago and it changed completely my perspective in the way that was great to understand more globally what was happening and what has been happening since then. Because sometimes when you are doing like something that's so new in your country, you are kind of the one or the only one or the few ones. You are part of the group that is just few ones. There is one in the city, the one is another one. And you think like, you, you, are, you, you live like a kind of lack of reference. And sometimes you think like you are a bit crazy. And when you go to a conference, to a place where you can meet a lot of people from different contexts and countries that are doing something similar, you can understand that you are more part of a movement that's something that is emerging than like doing something that maybe doesn't make sense or whatever. So I think gig for me since the beginning and all the Republic community was a lot about like the sense of belonging and the sense of, of like being part of something that maybe is not mainstream, is not like the main thing at the moment, but probably will in few moments. And as we had like all these years, we could see how the things changed and how um, a lot of the things that we are saying like uh, years and years ago now is like main topic and things are like uh, in Brazil, for example, I remember like in my first gig, things that we are doing was like so small and people are not like, giving a lot of attention. And a few years later, 
was like things that a lot of people was working inside and we could work, talk more in relevant places and things like that. So I think we could like be inspired a lot in other experience for people that are living in reality that sometimes is better than ours for like digital environments. And sometimes it's more similar because conference that are just like, for example, I before a gig, I went like for a conference that sometimes are people you had just people from one specific country or contest and then you can localize this all these topics for just like that this reality and when you have like such a diverse community you can understand more a global perspective and you can also find something that's more similar of the things that you are living so a lot of the moments and times and experience that i had during these years in republica and gig was a lot about like sharing practical knowledge about like specific topics that I was facing as a challenge in my work and I could find someone in Kenya or Filipinas or whatever that was facing something similar or faced it before and could learn me or we could share something on this topic. So I think it was a lot about this and was a lot about understand that sometimes you have to be patient when you are in a country that's not like uh, innovation and technology is not the main priority. Um, sometimes you have like you are facing social challenges that are bigger or you are just like in a lack of po public policy or whatever and when you have like this diversity of community it was great to understand like okay let's be patient and let's build all this process so I think it was a lot about this <laughs> I think that's a really beautiful uh, point that you made. A lot of the people in the gay community, and the same is true for the three of you, were really pioneers doing their work. So having a place where you can find, oh, look, there are others like me is a super helpful thing. And um, you reminded me of a quote of Kutai, who is also a member of the gay community. And I think she said so beautifully once along the lines of coming to Republica first from Zimbabwe and attending the conference helped to get a glimpse of the future for some of the technologies we were talking about, but being part of GIG and meeting the GIG community made her feel at home. And that's always something I really love to think about. Sheila, how about you um, and your, <laughs> your, yeah, your GIG journey and your Republica journey? Um, the last time we got together in person as a community was actually not in Berlin for Republica, but in Nakuru in Kenya. And, and a kind of different gig gathering, but also a really beautiful one. I hope we get to recreate in the not too distant future. So yeah, I'd love to hear some of your experiences. Well, um, I think my first gig, um, I was a bit skeptical to be honest, because I would, I, I, it was really hard for me to visualize um, what other people are doing. Um, but secondly, I wasn't sure about the energy because I think a lot of us are very passionate about what we do. So you don't really anticipate that you'll meet people who have equal passion about their work, but also about other people. And I think for me, that was the most, um, I think, mind-blowing thing. The fact that we met, we did not know each other at all, and we became really close within hours. It was literally like, my name is so and so, and all of us were following each other everywhere. We were discussing so many things that we were doing. We were finding um, a lot of challenges that we were experiencing were similar. People were very open to sharing uh, resources they had, if it was tools they were using, if it was introductions to people that, you know, were working on similar things um, like you are. And I think that openness um, is why it kind of built the, the foundation of what the community became because there was just... I, I, I don't know how to explain it. It was, it was just almost like it was meant to be. And I resonate with what Kudzai mentioned about just feeling at home with strangers who you would, and even you know, along the way, the following year, new people would come in, same thing. The, the, the year after, same thing. So I think that community continued to grow. What I think for me was even, I think more exciting was the fact that even after we left a Republica, the same energy did not die. All of us were still continuing the conversations on email. We were continuing conversations on instant messaging um, applications. And, um, you know, we were inviting each other to different countries to come and speak in our conferences. 
to talk to our community. So in a way, what the world is experiencing now, we were able to experience that slightly earlier, even though um, it wasn't like forced. Like now, you know, we can't travel. We have to do um, some of, for instance, this, this conversation. But we had been having these conversations virtually as a community because we wanted to learn from each other. We wanted to share um, what we were learning and you know what we were experiencing. And I think what also helped with that is most of the people within the network are also very visionary around uh, technology and intentions around growing you know, our grassroots communities around solutions that either we were building or building with them. And so coming to gig and seeing what other communities were doing in, in different countries around culture, you know, around technology, around the maker movement, you would go back with that. And because you knew someone who you would ask, you know, so how do we go about this? Do you know any open source solutions that we can use? Um, are there any materials that you guys use locally that you can deploy? It was always easy for people to start new initiatives, new um, interventions, build new communities because they'd already seen work elsewhere. And I think that really helped solidify the, uh, the relationship. A lot has changed. Um, in, in Kenya, for instance, we, in 2013, I think we were less than five hubs. We now have, have I think, over 100 in, in the country. So, I mean, there's just so much that has, has changed. You know, people are a bit skeptical around working with each other, but now I think people are more deliberate around, you know, communal approach to, to solving solutions. I think things that I would say networks like ours kind of pioneered in, in ensuring that conversations are centered around building communities, around uh, being deliberate, uh, um, uh, providing solutions at, at grassroots level, but also helping each other grow as individuals, but also organizations and, and community at large. So I think in, in that sense, um, even within the network, a lot has changed. I think um, most of us have, have uh, changed organization, but the mission of what we have always been doing and, and the passion that we've always had um, has remained. So I think in that sense, it's been um, a journey of growth. Um, you mentioned something around naivety, which I really, really am glad we were. Mm -hmm. Because we were not naive and all of us knew it all. I don't think we would have gotten as far as we are because everyone would have come with, but I know, I know, but all of us came with, I just want to learn. And I think that is important when you're building communities because you're, you're more open to sharing your challenges. You find out you're not alone. You're willing to share what you've learned. You're willing to share, you know, resources. You, you can reach out to someone easily. And so that naivety, I hope it never changes even within the community as we grow, because I feel like we can constantly continue to learn. Yeah, you're so right. I, I totally agree with that. Um, so many beautiful things said, and I think, you know, I could always just underline everything that you've pointed out in terms of the really deep and long lasting things that have developed from these initial meetings over the years. Um, you've all mentioned that, of course, it's a time now that we cannot travel and we're sort of trapped in our own localities. And I would definitely want to learn from all of you how your past year has been. What have you done in the meantime, especially in regard to being able to keep working and innovating with your communities when being together physically in your innovation spaces has not always been possible. So yeah, let, can I begin with you, Gabby? Of course, we all understand how absolutely dire the situation regarding COVID is in Brazil currently. Can you just outline how you've managed over the last year and perhaps also how Olabi has been trying to, yeah, serve its, in, its community and support it in times of COVID? Yeah, um, so it's, it's, it was a big challenge since the beginning, of course, because basically we just had to change completely. So we closed our space. So it's been more than one year that we are not open anymore, our physical space. And we changed completely all our programs to the digital. So in one hand, it was hard in the beginning because we have to change a, a lot of method methodologies and was like everything was new for a lot of people. But we experimented a lot of like great results and outcomes. 
So we had, for example, a program that is like a kind of digital literacy for elderly people that's called Aprenda com avó, that's like learn with a grandma. And we used to do more like um, hands-on training, connecting like uh, digital skills and even like electronics and stuff with more like uh, embroidery and more old style techniques. And then we we're like, oh my God, how can we change that? It's like, in the beginning, it sounds impossible. But basically, we changed this project for an online platform called with the same name, Aprenda com Avó, where basically we are teaching uh, like a network of people that usually is, is younger, like young people, teaching uh, older people how they can use internet um, to give classes on the Zoom and digital platforms about the skills that they have. So if you know a lot about embroidery, you can understand how can you use, how can you set this knowledge as a class, a long online class and make a course. And it was super successful. We had like more than 500 during four months of people from all around the country, just like getting this class online and the course wasn't like just one day or two days. Sometimes it's like three months or like a lot of meetings. So basically we are kind of helping them to be more familiar with digital skills. At the same time, we're kind of acknowledging all these um, skills that they have already. So we changed the topic, we changed the methodology, but we still had the focus and being in bring more close digital skills for elderly people. And on the other hand, it was difficult in the beginning, but what we discovered in the end was that we could do something more like national. And so we are nowadays working with like grandmas and people from all, of, all, all over the country. So it's a network of people that are learning, people that are teaching the elderly people that are learning and teaching at the same time. So there are a lot of layers in these networks and they're all like, uh, just like in every place in Brazil. So and it's been super intense and diverse and, and, and like uh, great to see how people are like sharing experience in this moment, especially like um, that we are all like inside home or we're supposed to be inside our home. So people are kind of in need of this kind of like um, space to share like ideas, knowledge, and have more like this kind of uh, things. Yeah. We also spent most of the time last year working with the pandemic in a network that was connecting initiatives that are producing uh, PPI and this kind of medical supplies for hospitals and health service. So it was just like a way that we find to contribute. So everything was in digital and all the trainings, all the things that we had, we just transform in digital programs. And then we gain the scale of the country and the internet. So, uh, so the result was Olabi growed more than 100% for the last year. So we are bigger now. And we are like working a lot and doing a lot of things, but we changed our methodology and our things. We still love the idea to have a space. We still like believe in this, like this kind of um, experience and how, how can you learn when you have like presential events, face-to-face -face, face -face meetings. But as we don't have like any horizons when the things are getting better, we are just like investing in the things that we can do right now and trying to learn with these and try to understand how can you adapt and how can you do something with the things that we have at the moment and wait to open again a space when like everything could be more safe. I didn't want to interrupt Alia. I just said, yeah, because it's, it's so, I hope it's okay to say this typical of you to see the silver lining and to try to find a positive perspective in terms of seeing how you can reach more people with your work during the time of the pandemic and yeah even increase the work that you're doing under the most difficult of circumstances thank you gabby jay i would love to hear from you next basically the whole of the philippines was literally locked at home for about a year and uh, you run one of the key innovation spaces how have you managed with your community um well since the lockdown we uh, we haven't opened um just like gabby uh we have we still have our space um 
with hoping that uh, things get better and we, we can all go back there and uh, and um, do stuff normally. But um, since then, we've actually been able to adjust our, our work methodologies. Um, we were sort of like continuing different programs. For example, we had a program that was dealing with uh, technology business incubators in universities around the country. Um, and we were taking um, projects and ventures out of those uh, TBIs, um, bringing them into the fold and then um, um, exposing them to our mentor network, um, giving them advice, expo export, uh, exposing them to our investor network. And um, we sort of just followed through virtually uh, because we had no choice and um, it worked out. Um, it was pretty successful. It ended maybe, I think, um, uh, quarter four of last year. And we were actually able to, in fact, find an investor for one of the ventures. So that uh, those are the positive things that uh, have come out. And because of that, we are about to start another one this year. Um, it's more official now, it's more structured. Um, last year was a pilot and um, this year is, is, um, is already um, a real thing. And this is actually with, uh, done with the, the uh, Department of Science and Technology of the government. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty good program that's adapted. People have gotten used to communicating um, both knowledge and advice over over virtually. I guess a lot of us are, have been used to it even before the, the lockdown. So so um, some of us have, have, have adapted very quickly more than others. But I think at this point in time, um, like you said, if you're looking forward in the future, things have changed. Um, a lot of people are more digitally savvy now. Um, by just by, by just by um, um, just to just to survive, they had they had to adapt um, both on on learning uh, on uh, communications, um, being able to collaborate as well, collaborating online, um, and um, and um, the other logistical uh, um, uh, factors, uh, uh, financial and all that. Everybody's doing things online now, shopping, commerce. So, even in Germany, Jay, you wouldn't believe, even in Germany, people started doing things online for the last year. I think well, uh, it's right. I, I believe that. <laughs> if, you wouldn't have survived if, 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 if you wouldn't. Um, and we've, we've, we've done that pretty well. And I think we're, we're, we're going to see a more, a different level of digital native um, coming out of this. Even if we, 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 we were able to come out and then and, and act normally, things are, are different now. People will behave differently. People yeah. will, will choose to stay at home um, because of uh, commuting, traffic. I don't know how it is in, in Brazil, Gabi, but here in the Philippines, the, the virtual space has, has been a boon for, for those that had to travel um, in traffic. It's a time saver. Yeah, yeah. I think like everything will change completely after that in cities like ours that you probably we will find like a, a way to stay more at home if it's not like that necessary to go. So people, people find that it's possible to work from home. So that's something good. Sheila, what's it been like for you? Luckily, the situation seems a little bit better in Kenya than it has in Brazil and the Philippines. How are you working with the court and your community at the moment? Well, um... I think for us, um, because I was pivoting at the time, career-wise, um, I had been with uh, IHAP for 10 years, and so I literally transitioned when we started our lockdown. So, you know, I had plans for COD and everything, but, um, you know, we're planning to do a launch, and, and luckily or unluckily, everything went on, on, on lockdown. So from the word go for us, we started working remotely. Um, and I think what has been interesting is growing a team remotely or starting a business remotely when you are used to a community that was very, very physical, like every day you would see people. And our space used to have more than 100 people daily. So it was very vibrant. There was a lot of things happening. And then all of a sudden, there's nothing. You're just yourself 
and you know you are uh, mostly online and it's interesting for like a day or two and then it really becomes hard because now you're trying to to even to plug into the community so it always has to be either chatting or calling and and things like that um but also at the same time you end up doing a lot more work than you would if you're in a physical space because maybe you're talking to someone maybe there's an event you're hosting and there was initially you know a bit of burnout because you would you would look up and then you realize wait it's midnight um you know and and you you constantly don't have you know even times to to walk maybe you're living from one place to another to, to go for a meeting that used to be useful um but i think over time what um has been very interesting for me is to just see how the digital community or innovation community in general has become much larger because of that we were able to work in nine countries just from the get go because a lot of the people were now coming into the digital space but they did not really know um especially in the continent how to go about that so i think helping communities to learn to to navigate the digital space to transition to the digital space for especially traditional industries i think has been quite interesting uh, one because of the perspective of how connected physically we are and how hung up on that concept of physical meetings people were that people are finding it really hard to transition to a digital space too i think it has also allowed us to see how much of a bubble and sorry to use that word we live in for people in the innovation and technology space because a lot more people are really struggling with very basic things that for us is a no brainer you know like even even having um uh, you know there's several team team um applications that we use to manage programs uh, for chatting with you know to to measure deliverables and very basic things for us but for a lot of people even huge companies they, they didn't have that it had to be we have to meet physically so for a lot of them they had to shut down to strategize around moving into that space um secondly i think for for people who are already in the innovation space um but they were also very siloed it became really lonely because it was just you and so it kind of forced people to to think beyond um just you know this silo that you know it's just us guys how can we collaborate with more people how can we find out you know solutions that other people are using how can we work together and um i think the saddest thing has been for at least for me is to just see how this has also accelerated the the gap between people who can access and people who can't because it's a bit costly you need you know connectivity we don't have connectivity everywhere you have to have a bit of money but for us as a team i would say it's been really really good because we've really grown and grown quite fast but for a lot of communities that we work with and people we've been able to interact with i wouldn't say it has been the same um and so that i think is um is how the situation has been yeah you know what's been really fascinating listening to you is that we're obviously from very different places and very different circumstances at the moment but i would say the exact same thing is true here so so many commonalities across the globe once again to folk finish with i'm just going to ask you very quickly to give a little bit of a shout out what would you birthday congratulations be for republica for gig to the next 8 and the next 15 years what are your hopes i hope we don't lose the sense of uh bringing people together um i think closed systems we've noticed do not work anymore and so for the next 15 years i hope we can open up as many networks as possible or as many opportunities for more people to plug into this amazing platform that republica has continuously provided and i hope that doesn't change let's bring more people in let them experience the magic that we have been able to experience for the next 15 years thank you so much <laughs> um gabby would you like to go next So it's hard to predict isn't it especially in this time of the year it's moment of the the life you know so 
uh, more and more I feel like that is hard to predict even in one or two months in advance, even like 15 years. So, but like my hope, the thing that I'm working on for is for like, I, to keep this idea that you can distribute power with all these technological tools and not like concentrate. So I know that we've been discussing that for more than like 15 years or since the beginning of the internet. But I still believe that we should like put efforts on this and understand that technology is not just a tool or it's not just like technical things that are, are working for like optimize or make something better. But it's something that needs to put like ethical values and more like the human values and the politics in the center of the process. Otherwise, we are just building tools and we can understand that it's being like kind of weird the words that we built so i hope for the 15 years that we can put like the social inequality of the whole world and of every country in different levels and ways in the center of this process of the discussion of innovation and technology and understand and, and try to make more ethical use of all these things otherwise probably um, the humanity and all of us will not survive for longer so I hope shared, definitely. Yeah. Jay, how about you? Um, I guess I'd like to see uh, Republica continue to um, show people like us, everybody else, uh, the world view that uh, we've actually experienced over the years. Uh, more people, bring more people in. Um, bring um, all the, um, and by worldview, the different uh, social issues as well, bring them to the surface. Um, it's funny that uh, when we started, well, in 20, 2013, the prevailing issues that we were talking about, it was just came out of Arab Spring. Um, we had the, the refugee um, issues um, uh, front and center. Uh, we had the Occupy movement. That was that was the that was that was that was the um, the atmosphere then. Um, us coming from the Philippines, we never knew that we would have to face different um, um, issues such as human rights, uh, digital rights in the Philippines back then. Now it's different. So things change over the years, um, and I hope that Republica continues to be a venue to bring um, this worldview to everybody and to bring the people that, um, that um, it's actually attracted over the years together to help solve these uh, social issues. I would like to say thank you to all three of you for doing that in the session today as well, for bringing three different perspectives from three very different countries to this opening session for our program this year's gig at Republica and Distributed Design Europe Community at Republica. And a special thanks because Jay, for you, it's in the middle of the night. For Gabby, it's you very early in the morning. And Sheila, you have a birthday of your own to celebrate. So thank you so much for making it for this opening session, for being a part of the gig and the Republica family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Miss you all and Miss Republica.
I'm very excited about the next session, which is going to be a hormonal home cooking show brought to you by the fabulous Mary Magic. She is an artist and a researcher and is going to take us on a little bit of a reflection today about the boundaries, biohacking, our bodies and what we can cook up in our own homes. Hello everyone, my name is Mary Magic and I am an artist trained in biology and media arts and sciences. I'm originally from Los Angeles and I'm now based in Vienna. Today, I want to tell you all about a world we all live in called the Astro World, an alien landscape that is colonized by hormones. So how did I come to realize this? Well, in 2015, I started a research project called Open Source Estrogen, looking at all the ways our bodies are controlled and managed at the molecular level. When you type in estrogen into Google image search, you can see that our primary relationship with estrogen has always been through the pharmaceutical industry and the corporate sciences. At the same time, hormones exist all around us as a state of environmental toxicity with petrochemical and agricultural industries producing molecules that permeate every aspect of the planet, causing unprecedented levels of physiological, neurological, and reproductive mutations. This happens because the estrogen receptor is highly promiscuous, meaning the opposite of selective. Furthermore, this receptor is shared with almost all animal taxa. So that's why we see frog, fish, and bird populations in decline due to endocrine disruptors in the environment. This is the collective mutagenesis of the estro world. But just as the body can be stolen, it can also be reclaimed. If our world is an alien landscape colonized by hormones, what does it mean to decolonize our bodies and environments? What kinds of strategies can we do as citizens in a collective struggle with the human, the non-human, and the planetary? There are many terms to describe my practice. Hormone hacking, freak science, estrogen geeking, but the term I align most with is public amateurism, meaning learning, doing, and failing in the public sphere and removing the hierarchy of the expert. This in turn creates critical spaces for collective queerings of the status quo. One of the first hormone protocols I explored was the use of transgenic yeast biosensors for detecting endocrine disruptors. With these yeast that act as extensions of our bodies, I could finally visualize the molecular semiosis that happens when estrogen comes in contact with our estrogen receptors. Because I was running workshops all around the world called Estrofem Lab, I created a mobile lab for traveling with my transgenic yeast and all, of its, all its reagents. Oddly enough, I never got in trouble with airport security, even though I was obviously carrying very sketchy stuff. The next mobile lab that I created is what I like to call the extraction lab. And this lab is used for extracting hormones out of the environment and out of your own urine using a DIY column chromatography method and peristaltic pumps. The results of the urine extraction is a brown sticky substance you see at the bottom of the tube. After the workshop, we take turns smelling each other's hormones, which are now pheromones, that can activate an ancient and evolutionary response in our brains. You either love the smell, you hate it, 
or you smell nothing at all. The same urine protocol was used in a 10 minute speculative fiction film called Housewives Making Drugs, where trans women are the stars of their own fictional cooking show, teaching the audience at home how to extract your own hormones in the kitchen and taking your bodies into your own hands. I wanted to offer a vision where a feminist concepts of body sovereignty could be applied to biohacking and biotechnology and that science could be performed by and for queer people. At the same time, at the end of the show, the audience gets on stage and we all take shots of hormones together in a catchy estrogen song and dance. Continuing to bridge hormones and cultural discourse, I came across an article where two species of fish were hybridized to create a hermaphrodite species and the species was called a hopeful monster in the title of the publication. With all the toxicities that we're exposed to every day, why can't our bodies also be considered hopeful? For example, this blogger writes, I don't think it's right that the government is putting birth control pills in the water supply and making all the men gay because we need both men and women to propagate the species. So it's very easy to slip back into homophobic, transphobic, and even xenophobic discourse when you're talking about endocrine disruption. So in response to this, I created the Molecular Queering Agency, a fictional service that guides participants through the process of queering through an audiovisual projection and a urine worshiping ritual. The participants put on oxygen masks containing hormones therefore consenting to their colonization. In order to neutralize fear and panic, I present to them a three-step process for living in an increasingly queer world. Step one, toxicities. You live in an alien landscape that is colonized by hormones. Step two, semiosis, but you're already alien with plastic in your blood and in your urine. Lastly, subjectivities. Do you want to be more alien than you already are? In this permanently polluted world, we see that not all bodies are created equal. A doctor looks between your legs when you're born and decides if you're a male or female. For intersex, trans, and queer people, their bodies are often unjustly policed and pathologized by medical science and institutional gatekeeping. So I created a work in progress called Genital Panic, where participants walk into a staged gynecology office, sit in the chair and make 3D scans of their own genitals to be submitted into an anonymous online database that is crowdsourced from the masses. I asked myself, what does a queer feminist population study look like? where the authority of science that has always policed gender and sex normativity was removed and came from the bottom up rather than the top down. I thought we need to be making spacious room for all disobedient bodies. After all, we're all glitches of our material consumerist culture. What we buy and eat and drink and inhale creates different combinations inside of our bodies. In fact, we are not the fixed and stable constructs that we're told we are. It's really about what kind of inclusive future we want to build. We live in an astral world, but it can also be our astral world.
Our first In Conversation With session is for me a key piece of the program that we're bringing to you today. Bart Vitter, who's the founder of Hippo AI and has really created groundbreaking work in the area of open health by creating data standards that weren't existing before and trying to revolutionize how we see health and how we treat our data accordingly, is going to be in conversation with Nick Caldry, who is a professor at London's LSE and has coined the term data colonialism and brought forth such important concepts about the way that we think about our personal data and how we should govern it as a society in future. I'm so excited to pass the stage over to you, Bart and Nick, for your conversation on Data is Life. Hi, my name is Bart Witter. I'm the founder from the Hippo AI Foundation, and my mission is to open source medical artificial intelligence by creating data and AI commons. I'm your host for today. The following is a conversation with Nick Caldry from the London School of Economics. Nick, I was looking forward for this moment to have this conversation. So I'm very uh, excited. And before we get into our topic that is both or leading or uh, most taking over control of our life, what we are doing, um, I have a, a, a warm up question. So I ask this to everyone and there is no right or wrong answer. Um, but what do you think of when you hear the word hippo? Well, there are two answers. One is Hippo is a recycling company in the UK, and it's the name of Hippo is on every recycling plant in Britain. So that, that's one thing I think of. Also, it made me think of uh, St. Augustine, the great Christian philosopher who was born or lived in Hippo in North Africa. So there's an important, and of course, he was one of the, the he was the first person to really think of the interrogation of the self. So he's very important in thinking about the freedom of the self. This is why I asked the question. I, I learned uh, so many new aspects about the word hippo. <laughs> I also learned that this, uh, uh, the, the person with the highest income is also called a hippo. So all oh. different things. <laughs> <laughs> so hippos are everywhere. Um, but now, very seriously, coming to um, your work, um, you, you have been probably very making the life of some people very uncomfortable and you have been very vocal uh, during your public discussions and more specifically in the book that you co-authored with Alyssis Mejias of the State University of New York uh, called The Cost of Connection that I can recommend all the listeners to buy and, and read um, uh, because it's an eye-opening book for me. Um, you mentioned that we are witnessing today in the digital economy is, is a turning point in humanity. You also going one step further as the concept of Chajana Zubov that uh, she described in her book, Surveillance Capitalism, because you are suggesting that the current power asymmetries between the digital data-driven platforms and the users um, will pave the way of a new stage of capitalism with outlines we only partly can see. And you call it the capitalization of life without limit. You mentioned, and I quote, that there will be uh, no part of human life, there will be no layer of experience that is not extractable for economical value, and human life will be there for mining by corporations without reserve. And you mentioned that this process of capitalization will be the foundation of a highly unequal new social arrangement, end quote. During my discussions uh, in my work, I've quoted you uh, many times, I think it's over a hundred, and I even lost friends quoting you. <laughs> um, I have uh, had a friend who has an AI-based company that he sells as AI for good uh, in Africa. He's extracting data, but he's creating value, economical value in Berlin. I also quoted this quite loud during an AI for good conference in Geneva, where Google presented their uh, AI-based solutions for health in India where out of my point of view, they were doing social experiments with very poor people, giving them access to some kind of detection system. Um, and I call it as well data colonialism. Um, so very short question before we deep into the topic, but um, I saw the reactions. You, How do you deal with the reactions bringing such a strong term? Like, um, because it's, it is not a term that everybody wants to hear and discuss about. Well, 
yes, it is it does provoke strong reactions. It is sensitive, uh, and we can see why if we compare it with Shishana Zubov's very important thesis of surveillance capitalism, which I admire very much, and we have a lot in common with. But at its core, even though it seems very broad, Zuboff is basically saying there's a rogue, set of rogue capitalists, Google, Facebook, and the like, who've gone down a bad branch path, a variant of capitalism, which is wrong because it, it seizes surveillance assets from human beings. We need to reform them, and then we can get back on the path of capitalism, which is basically good which if insofar as it uses data, it does so for a valid purpose of personalizing services. That, in our view, misses the bigger picture, the even bigger picture, which is that the benign language of data capture, which we hear in every sector from agriculture to health to education today, the benign capture of data as a social good, uh, needs to be rethought in terms of a much longer history of capture. And that history is the history of colonialism. And that's a fact about history. It's not our invention that 500 years ago, roughly, two powers, Spain and Portugal, followed them by Holland and Britain, decided, saw that it was possible to capture the Earth's resources, the land, the resources in the land, the bodies to work the land. And we're arguing we're now at the beginning of an equally significant new epoch, the epoch of data colonialism, where a new thing is seized, which is human life itself. And the big data is the language for that capture. That is designed to be provocative because it's designed to open us to see the meaning of that if we take into account those parallels. And it is quite shocking because as we know historical colonialism was the start of a massive new inequality on a geopolitical scale, which created the world basically as an unequal space. Why do you call it? Because if I look into uh, data, data is for uh, some people bits and bytes. It is not a life. It is a, a, a yeah. recording. Why do you call it um, um, that it's capitalization of life, human life? How can you create a digital, uh, very abstract bits and bytes and are connected yes. to, to human life? Well, at the fundamental level, and health brings this out very well, uh, the accounts we give, the stories we can give, the information we can give out about our life, uh, are fundamental to that life. We can be damaged by the bad information that circulates uh, about our life. Crucial health information about us, the nature of our genome sequence, is the core of the information relevant to our life. So if it goes into the wrong hands, that's extremely dangerous. So therefore we can't ignore the consequences of information for life, uh, particularly not health information, and I think in a real sense, to capture data from life is in a broadest sense to capture life itself, because it is capture all the parameters of what can be said and known about that particular life. So another way of looking at it from the other end, from the corporate end, is that for the first time in human history, about 30, 40 years ago, it became possible for corporations, large corporations of all sorts, to have a different relation to human life. Before human life was there as a set of consumers, a set of users of services, it did what it did. If it connected with corporations, that was great. If it didn't, it didn't. But because of the emergence of the internet and particularly the intranet, as an input, a direct input to business, it became possible for corporations to imagine that life was part of the corporate process. It was a direct input to that process. And that is a radically new historical possibility. And that is the root of the idea of big data that we see celebrated everywhere. So that's why we talk about the capitalization of life without limit. Because basically, if you imagine that human life exists within the corporate domain it's not separated from it in his own space it exists it grows it develops within the corporate domain for capture then there are no limits to what corporations can do with that 
it is a capture from the beginning in advance that's why we call it capitalization of life without limit it's a fundamental shift in human history and power relations between human beings and corporations and that's that's quite interesting and 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 very insightful like what, what we did in in the foundation is we, uh, we a lot of people are the metaphors data is a new oil and data is a commodity and um we see data in healthcare as a reflection of human life because um uh, we are in a very early stage of digitalization, but um, the further we move, um, when it's, it will be in quantum uh, computing or whatever kind of simulation we will be able uh, to replicate, then uh, somebody can uh, make an exact copy of um, yourself. And then uh, this is um, a reflection of your human life. The other part what we are looking at is why it's human life, because in that data are also the solutions for uh, finding answers on diseases. And um, if somebody extracts that data and owns that data and owns these answers, um, then you also um, own human life because then you have an asymmetric uh, power relationship between uh, the corporate and the society that is looking then for cures. Um, is there, I want to go a bit more into the framing of the term data colonialism and is data monetization or looking at data as a commodity in healthcare the same then as, as data colonialism or are there differences there in, in your concept? Well, commodification is what enables the, the capitalist economy to operate. That was Marx's theory 150 years ago and it's still broadly correct today that by things being able to be exchanged on the market for value, they enter the possibility, they enter the capitalist economy. That's commodification. So um, monetization of data, uh, many of these proposals which will come on to that you should be able to receive money for your personal data, they in effect normalize data as a commodity. And that is a precondition for data colonialism. It's not the same as the land grab, which is what we mean by data colonialism, but it's a key precondition. And therefore, I think we need to be really careful about the idea that, for example, we should be selling our personal data, or our health data, because that's commodifying it, which is exactly incorporating it within the capitalist economy. When your important metaphor, data is human life, is a way of saying, no, it must be more than that. I, I think the phrase data is human life is very interesting because in one sense, it's, it's not true because um, human life is more than data. Human life is a natural phenomenon on the earth that's emerged over billions of years. Data is a highly precise construction within very particular infrastructures of storing data, transferring data, uh, counting things on computers, which is an emergence just in the last few seconds, as it were, of human history. It's highly artificial. So in that sense, data is not human life. But you get to the core of the issue with your phrase, though, because in another way, capturing the data that is generated from human life is the same as capturing life itself. It's capturing all the informational possibilities of life, which are vital for the development of that life, both on a moral, civic level, but as you say, at a health level as well. So I, I agree with your phrase, if we translate it that way, absolutely, data is human life in that sense. And therefore we must, we must take care of it and we must treat it as something of greater value than the economy fundamental to the possibility of a good economy yeah and and, and there are already um, ai based services like there is a, a company uh, called replica.ai um, that um, was derived out of a story of somebody losing her friend and then she took all the communication data and she created a replica of uh, a communication chatbot that um, was about that reacting just as a diseased diseased person um, and now she created a startup around that, that you can replicate yourself. Now, I've looked at the terms and conditions of that startup. Um, you can uh, retract the data, but you don't own the model itself. Um, and that means that 
there is something that is behaving like you that is trained on your data that is already feels like it's alive if you put pause the Turing test um, but it is a reflection of you but you don't own it and and that's what exactly what you point out like we are um, um, in that sense in a digital world taking ownership of of part of your life and and that's one of the the, the, the without limits that's one of these directions uh, where this is heading to in, in the sense that we see that in deep fake porno movies uh, as well where faces of uh, celebrities are being used um, where suddenly uh, that's also data <laughs> that is being used to um, act it in a very different way. Um, well, if I could just comment on that, I mean, one can comment on that philosophically because we, we know that data is used to predict. We know that marketers have ambitions to predict our reactions, our emotions on the basis of the data they already have about our past. So it's not just about the present. Um, philosophically, these we're now entering to a new ter new area where it hasn't until recently been necessary to talk about this question of ownership. Hegel, 200 years ago, um, wrote, said in an astonishing way that our body is our property. Mm -hmm. We own our body. It's a very jarring, strange phrase <laughs> because of course we don't literally, that's not legally true. It's not politically true. We don't think that way. But what he was trying, Hegel was trying to get at is that for the very possibility of existence as a human being in the world, there's a material basis of that, which includes the body, but including the mind, of course. And therefore, what we experience through our bodies, our embodied minds, is in that sense, we can call it our property. But he says it's inalienable. It's, it, it's the one property you cannot give away and still be that human being. I think that's where our fundamental rise of uh, um, yeah. dignity and integrity exactly, uh, is exactly to protect it. Um, we, we have fought for this um, uh, to protect it. And now we are copying it into a digital realm where we're going to have to fight again for our digital rights, which should actually be the same as our analog rights. But what is so interesting is that Hegel said this 200 years ago because he was trying to get to the fundamental roots of freedom. And he was a fundamental thinker. He never imagined this would be a problem. <laughs> the only case he thinks of people who lose control of that fundamental property are slaves. In the footnote to that comment, he says, slaves have lost this, but everyone else has this basic freedom. Now we are encountering a moment in history where that property over the information flow of your life, which is what we experience as our life, is at stake in a corporate game and including the genomic sequence that underlies all those possibilities. So this is a sign that we're entering really fundamental philosophical territory here. But if, like, if you compare it to colonialism, I used, uh, uh, in my naive days in 20, 2008, I used to service 23ME because I wanted to find out um, um, where my ancestors came from and which diseases I was a, a quantified self and I wanted to quantify everything. I read determined conditions, yes. <laughs> but at, at the time, uh, uh, during those days, determined conditions can always be changed. Um, I still had to pay over a thousand euros to get my data sequenced and I was still not a product, but then the business model changed and the terms of conditions changed. Uh, consequentially, I pulled back my data. Um, but I think I'm one of the 0, 0 0.1 users out there. But if you compare it to colonialism, um, um, nobody, I think, for my knowledge, uh, asked uh, consent. Uh, but in these platforms, you have to give consent. Um, isn't, isn't that the difference between colonialism and data colonialism, that, that there is uh, this legal uh, step where we give consent for people to process our data? Well, this is an important point, and it's something that, makes people sometimes puzzled about why we're talking about data colonialism here. So we have to put it in a bit of historical context. Um, so what we're saying is colonial is the land grab, the taking of the asset. Originally it was land, now it is human life itself in the form of data. That's where we say the comparison occurs. So let's grant, if you grant that for a second, how can this be done? 
500 years ago, the colonialists went out to the Americas, which they didn't know exist until they found it. And they had no social relations whatsoever with the people they found there, nothing. They recognized them as human beings, that was all. They therefore only had two means to grab the gold and the silver, which was brute violence and lying, pretending to do something else while taking the gold and silver. And they did both. Um, they did both. Now, however, the new colonialism, if that's what it is, is emerging on the basis, not just of 500 years of colonialism, but two to 300 years of capitalism. The highly organized configuration of social relations around profit, around commodification. And that's why today violence, physical violence, isn't necessary to achieve a new colonial end. We just need to tweak the terms, the, the legal terms that govern the operation of our mobile phone devices, and we can already achieve the transfer of rights that is necessary for the colonial appropriation because this is now happening on the basis of capitalism. That's the reason the violence isn't there. That's the reason we have something like consent, but it isn't really consent because people don't know what it is they're consenting to. They're consenting to some future, the capture of a future, the capture of the future of their data, which is by definition unknowable at that point in the present. So it's never a full consent given. It is never informed consent. Um, never informed consent, not at least as it normally operates, but there may be ways that socially we can ground consent in a different way, and I'm sure we'll come back to that. The, 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 the replica example that I gave you, if you go on the terms and condition, the privacy terms, the last sentence is written that these terms can always um, be changed again, so yeah. and that you have to regularly check if they are. <laughs> um, and I know this from lawyers in the emerging acquisition space that without putting this on there, uh, they will have um, problems exiting the company, uh, the startup. And with the exit, you sell the most valuable asset, which is then the data in terms of the acquisition uh, strategies. Um, okay, we're talking about, I, I think I understood your, your concept, but um, now the solution. <laughs> Um, uh, because we can always talk about um, all these um, uh, um, radical approaches that Facebook started with, but what are these, uh, and we're going to go in, in deeper into that, but how do you then decolonize already colonized data, or does it start by creating an alternative system? Um, how do you decolonize um, this world from these data platforms? Well, what we're saying, and this is another implication of the data colonialism phrase, is that it's a whole social and economic order being built here around this capture of data. It's a fundamental transformation. So we can't dismantle it by me stopping to use Facebook or me refusing to enter into this genetic sequencing option that I might have. It has to be done collectively. Um, and it's a matter really of thinking about what would a genuine social consent to the gathering of data for genuine social purposes be. Because if we're saying that in general, capturing a life's data stream is a default option, which is I fear where we're moving to very much with some of the rhetoric from the EU and many corporations and so on. If the default option is that your data is captured, it exists within the corporate domain, therefore life is captured, then we need to think about, can we imagine situations where there are purposes where we, where we need data to be gathered, let's say to cure a disease, where everyone in the society would agree with that goal, they would understand the purposes of the data use, they would have transparent access to the modalities of that data use, they would have the chance to refuse consent if they change their mind. And there will be an ongoing social debate really central to society's functioning because health is at the core of society's continuing at all, which would be the ground, the basis of saying there is social consent to this particular use of this particular type of health data. And that would be unproblematic because it will be so it would be as it were the community saying we together want to give this thing we all have together 
which is the information generated by our living together into a common pool to be used for our common purposes. Which is very similar to the, what I'm doing with exactly. my uh, data. That would be valid, yes. And I'm licensing, licensing them uh, for creating what I then call open knowledge. Um, the, the difficulty here um, is we live in a world where um, people don't care if they send text messages from A to B and if others sell the data as long as it's for free. But the same people, if you would ask them to send a letter by, by a postal service that is free, but this postal letter is then being opened and copied and then being sold, uh, most probably nobody would use that because it's a letter and it would be open and that should not be open. Like the, the way of thinking in the analog world is very different than the way of thinking in a digital world. And I, I figured it completely out, but I think it's partly a lack of education. Um, but at the same time, um, if these things come for free and the uh, industry always hacks the human psychology uh, in terms of getting him, giving him consent by always giving something back. Um, how do you deal then with creating a movement? Because that's my challenge. We started social media campaigns uh, and, and, and this will take a very long time um, uh, until we get there. But like, how do you close that gap from our behavior that is so much different in the analog world as in the digital world? Uh, space out there? Is it going to close by itself? Um, no. Uh, well, I, I, I think it's a matter of social imagination. I mean, that's the reason that Ulysses Lachias and I wrote this book, The Cost of Connection, which is to try and uh, start a debate in society about how we imagine living in a connected way, because we want to be connected, but on different terms, without this default data extraction. And that's an act of the historical imagination, the social imagination. And that's difficult because uh, I think another aspect of what's changing as part of this new data-fied social order is that what we call society isn't the same as society was before this order came into being. We still carry in our heads the idea that we have our bodies, we move around in space, we touch each other. Yeah, we touch computers as well. And, put inputs into a computer system and somehow magically that involves the transfer of information somewhere we can't see it but we like it when it happens and we don't like it when it doesn't happen that's our view of the social world on a daily basis what we can't grasp and we need to grasp is that social space now operates in through forms of power between every point and every other point it's not a matter of the king sitting on his seat, ruling us from one point in space. Computers are the source of government, of order, of power. And every, where everything we carry has a computer in it. And every computer potentially can govern other computers because of the basic structure of the internet. So the nature of the space we live in is radically transformed in the past 30 years. It's a point to point space of power with radically much higher dimensional forms of power operating in it than the old version we were thinking of until around 1990. And we haven't got used to this yet. We need to think about that. But one way to think about that is to think about positive versions of that. Maybe it would be positive if each of us were to contribute the data that could be consensually gathered from the operations of our heart as a way of monitoring the risks, what causes the risks of heart disease. It might be something we would all consent to, to increase our knowledge as human beings and something we could only do through this new, radically new, uh, datafied social space that we're living in. But if we could start to imagine positive possibilities, that would get clearer bad possibilities as well. At the, so I think it's very important to think about positive uses of this new space of connection, because then we'll start to clear, be clear about what we definitely don't want, the sort of powers we definitely don't want corporations or governments to have in this radically new social space we're living in today. What happened between 2001 and now? Because in 2001, and this is quite 
funny and surprising that I ever would quote these two persons. I was not a huge fan of their policies. But Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, they fought back against uh, companies that were worth billions already um, in uh, venture capital investments, and uh, they were not on the stock exchange yet, that were patenting the human genome. And um, they decided to regulate the human genome and make it a common good. Because, and, and in, the, in that speech, they said, like, this is uh, for the um, uh, sake of humanity and, um, and the progress of society. We need to keep this a common good. And I asked myself, what happened since 2001 that a Bill Clinton and Tony Blair were telling this kind of story where today we have Ursula von der Leyen um, going for the opposite? Um, I, I don't get it. What, what is what is um, wh why is there nobody is it becoming too complex is it um, uh, because of the power becoming so strong that that, that I, I, what is your opinion that that we have such a discrepancy between back then and now well i i think what we're seeing is the result of moving away from your fundamental principle that data is human life it is what emerges in the space of information from life it is the future and the present of life which is the natural default position it's what human beings would naturally say <laughs> um, because we all know information in our own life what i know about my life is my life it is what i remember about it what i share about it. that is my life that's the natural default position but what's taken over is a discourse i would call it an ideology which um uh, Yuval Harari, the historian, calls it dataism. Others call it dataism, which is the idea that data is the means of controlling life. Every data must be gathered from life so that life can be governed and controlled in the interest of power. This has been developed within market ideologies in the United States, developed within communist, um, different non market ideologies within China. Europe is potentially in the middle of this. It is, does have the potential to offer something different. But at the moment, it looks like it's orientating itself more to the market discourse. It's not offering anything different, although all the European legislation says that everything should be done in accordance with the European values. Mm -hmm. I'm not clear what those European values are. They don't seem to be very clearly articulated in the proposed legislation, except some limited reference to some controls under using human rights, but that's not sufficient to deal with the social challenges here. So what's going on is really the capture of life by a data is discourse, which argues that power over data will become the new form of power over life. And that's what social beings, that's what citizens have to challenge. It's only taken 20 years to do it. It can be reversed then, then in the next 20 years. Wow, um, these were powerful words, um, and I think uh, as a uh, um, ending of our conversation, I, I leave it like this. I could go and touch on other topics, but uh, dear Nick, thank you so much for you. Uh, this conversation. Thank you for being courageous. Um, thank you yeah. for your work, which is inspiring for me. Um, I feel really honored and thankful that you allowed me to have this conversation, and I hope the uh, our audience will uh, enjoy spread it because I think it is high noon that we start thinking about the utopias. <laughs> so let's create them together. Yes. Thank you well, so much. Thank you, Bart, and I admire your work. And I'm sure my co-author Ulysses Machias would have loved to be part of the conversation too, if that had been possible. Good luck in your work. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank Pleasure. you.
parable started with a question. We are all different. Then why care for everyone the same? Are you wondering what carables are? Carables are tailor-made solutions designed to suit patients' needs. In carables, we create solutions that answer real personal problems. We co-design so people become creators and not only users of innovation. Healthcare professionals, patients, designers and makers come together to create healthcare devices. We aim to empower people, teach others so that everyone can become more technologically literate. Prototype, prototype. We share how we make and openly document the project making. Join our global community at caribals.org. The first talk in our program is going to be held by the fabulous Mathilde Berchamp, who is currently with the Future Lab in Paris, 
and she is going to take us on a little reflection whatever happened to that home factory we were promised and the 3d printer in our houses why is it not there yet and when is it coming so about the future of 3d printing and where we're at with it today over to you Mathilde Hi everyone, hi, welcome, thanks for connecting. I'm super happy to be here with you. Um, my name is uh, Mathilde Berchon. Um, I'm, uh, I've been involved in the maker movement, 3D printing for about 10 years. Uh, I actually have wrote a few books in French about 3D printing um, and, and work for multiple startups, maker spaces, um, companies that uh, are involved in, the, in this movement as well. Um, so super happy to be here. The goal of this talk is really to tell you more about 3D printing and mostly really go um, through the, the phases of the 3D printing movement because I think we are really uh, entering a phase that's super interesting and that could really inspire you to, um, to get going with this, um, uh, these technologies. Um, so actually, how did I get involved with this movement? It all started with a big dream. I always, uh, as a teenager, I really dreamed of living in San Francisco. Uh, and so I actually moved there from, from Europe to uh, Silicon Valley uh, in the year about 2010. Uh, and I really discovered something that was amazing there. That was this explosion of um, maker uh, culture. So there was uh, spaces like uh, hacker spaces, there were maker spaces with, uh, or fab labs with, uh, so actual places where people would meet, share tools, share machines, and share knowledge, um, and, uh, and teach each other, learn from each other um, by documenting projects and by just sharing um, uh, the inspiration around making things. Um, and so that's really a movement that's based on empowerment. Uh, as you, you might know, uh, the idea is that if you give tools to somebody, they can uh, learn and they can actually start to um, entangle, understand the world differently. Um, and that's really what I think is super inspiring in this whole movement. And that's really also what made uh, 3D printing in spe specifically uh, uh, like a symbol for a new alternative world uh, that we could create together. Um, so the idea is really to um, uh, give the tools and the knowledge uh, to anybody who wants to understand how the world works. So the products around us usually are kind of like black boxes. We don't really know where the products come, how they are made, which materials they are made of. Uh, we can't even really open most of the products around us. Uh, they are sealed, right? And when you open them, you, you can't really have access to, um, to, to the way they are, they are made. Like it's something that is not easily shared. Um, and it's also something that makes us not be very able to repair, to fix uh, what's broken. Uh, and when it's broken, usually we end up buying a new product or replacing it because, well, it's too complicated. We don't know how to fix it. Um, so the idea of, um, of the maker movement was really to completely change this uh, and finally give access to citizens to machines so they can actually make products themselves, uh, modify products, adapt uh, the products around us uh, so they are more usable and fitting our needs, and also being able to open those black boxes and understand how they, how they work to be able to open up the world and give back the power finally to, to, to citizens. So to go from being passive consumers to actual active uh, members of society that can actually have an impact on the world around us. So that was really the, 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 the promises of the maker movement. And I think uh, it also came from having access to new tools, to new machines. And 3D printers really came at a time um, where, um, where there was this, uh, this, um, this desire. It was really a meeting point where there was this desire to understand better the world around us. And those tools were giving us these opportunities. So in the year 2010 to 2014, it's really a specific moment in time. It's a moment where 3D printing uh, became suddenly a technology where that uh, um, was uh, available for anybody. Uh, before that, actually, 3D printing, as you might know, was um, started in the 80s. Uh, the first 3D printer was actually sold in 1988. 
Um, so it's, uh, it's a technology that be existed for a long time and that was mostly used by industries for prototyping. So it was machines that were pretty big uh, and that were uh, used by experts, by people who knew what they were doing. And it was really the, the beginning of the, the, the 3D printing was mostly used for prototypes. Um, very functional, realistic prototypes, um, but uh, that, was, uh, that was it. Uh, and so in the year 2009, uh, one of the patents around 3D printing expired. Um, the FDM, uh, Fused Deposition Modeling Patent, expired. And so that uh, opened up possibilities for a lot of those makers that were uh, hanging out in hyperspaces, in makerspaces, to actually start tinkering. Finally, there were some technologies that were open and uh, available to uh, actually being modified. And so what started as an academic project in the, in the UK, in the University of Bath, um, by uh, Adrian ba ba Bader and his team, um, became, um, so they decided to open up the machines to make them open source and to share the plans online. So everybody who would want to create their own printer, build their own machine, was able to do it uh, with uh, one rule, which is to be in open source hardware, right? To document how you do it to reshare the information online for other makers to build, uh, uh, build up uh, uh, upon you. So that was the idea. And so because we were at the time where there was this strong, uh, these spaces that were starting, there was also um, uh, online uh, platforms that were, that were there. Uh, everything was in place. And so all the people around the world, like tons of makers, started to uh, download the files and make their own printers. And so that's really what uh, suddenly gave rise to this 3D printing uh, as a, really as a symbol, as a potential um, uh, machine that could really completely revolutionize the world and the way we make it. Um, and so a lot of makers started to uh, team up together to start their own companies. So for example, at the time there was MakerBot uh, that was one of the strong visionary behind the movement uh, with the idea that everybody is going to buy a printer um, it's going to be a bit like a computer or a phone. We're all going to have one uh, at home and we'll be able to print uh, easily anything we want just by the push of a button. So that was a bit the, the message that was sent around, in, around that time. So tons of, um, of hopes, right, of promises. You might be familiar with a, a famous uh, curve called the Gartner hype cycle. So it's, it's really like um, the usually uh, almost all innovations go through those phase, phases. So there is this moment of high expectations where we everybody is a strong believer that it's going to change the world, it's going to be amazing. And so every like a lot of people get gets uh, excited, enthusiastic about the technology and starts um, uh, start companies, start projects, start to use the, the actual technologies. And then phew, there is a huge crash. Uh, and so that's exactly what happened for 3D printing uh, around the year 2000. 15, something like this, for uh, three to four years, it was this big crash where actually the users, the first pioneers, right, that started buying printers, thinking, oh, they could, they could use it, actually had a bit, bit of a reality check uh, because uh, maybe you're familiar with this, but of course, if you uh, buy a printer, you will realize quickly that it's not so easy. Uh, you are pretty uh, limited uh, if you don't know uh, modeling software, if you don't know how to um, scan something and then modify it. Like it, you need to be pretty techy to be able to actually get good results with those 3D printers. <clears throat> Even if the, there were more and more 3D printers being uh, more easy to use, and etc. Like it's still uh, something that takes some work. It's not so uh, so easy. So plug and play. So um, that's that's what happened. That was a bit of uh, of a reality check, really. Of okay, what what am I actually going to do with this printer? So a lot of printers actually uh, stayed in closet and were not used so much. But what happened is that during that time, um, a lot of the actors of people working in 3D printing kept working on 3D printing. We're not so um, following, you know, the media bubble around the technology. And so those those people that there's this foundational like team maker community that has kept working with 3D printing also in industries, right? Like a lot of companies got equipped with 3D printers at the time. Many of them did not really make use of it, but a, a bunch of them, a good niche of them, actually kept working hard to learn the technology and see what they can actually do with it. And those, those, those foundational um, um, 
practices actually um, are, are really right now, you can see that we are entering a new phase, like since 2018, something like this. Uh, we are really back like on a, on a much more uh, realistic approach around 3D printing. So we are not talking as much about, um, uh, you know, like a disruptive revolution uh, that, you know, from one, one day you do things this way, the other day you actually 3D print everything. Of course not, that's not the way it is. Um, the expectations are much more realistic now. And so that we are really entering a phase of actual um, growth. The movement is, is continually uh, growing, but with people who are much more knowledgeable about the technology and are actually um, able to, um, to see the potential as they are. Um, so what we see now is, uh, first of all, um, one, um, one myth that got um, uh, bursted is uh, the idea that, okay, uh, there was the idea that 3D printing is going to replace everything. That's not going to happen, right? Like what happened, uh, what we see now in the, in the way people are using 3D printing is that it's more like an additional uh, technology that you combine with other technology. So for example, in industry, additive manufacturing is definitely a game changer. Um, but for example, it's a game changer for tooling. So you can actually 3D print molds um, in a much more efficient way thanks to the arrival of uh, metal 3D printing. You can actually print tooling. So conventional processes and 3D printing are hand in hand, really. They work together. And so we are really um, uh, improving the way we make things um, uh, with use of less resources, uh, optimization of shape. Like you can really um, improve already a lot of the conventional processes thanks to additive manufacturing. So that's one, one step. Like now we are more aware that, okay, 3D printing is, is linked to uh, it's it's part of a big um, big ensemble of uh, of processes. The second thing um, is that we now have a very strong awareness uh, of a specific field called design for additive manufacturing. So what is design for additive manufacturing? It's the understanding that when you you create you you create a product for three D printing, a piece for for three D printing, it needs to be designed a certain way. Like there is special keys around 3D printing that you can't, you don't find in with other tech, um, processes. And so that's something that is a, a big, big challenge um, nowadays is that a lot of engineers, uh, designers have been trained um, in school with conventional processes and they had to learn a new way. Because when you uh, design for 3D printing, for additive manufacturing is the same word, when you design for 3D printing, you need to think the parts uh, differently. Uh, for example, consolidation um, in the con conventional processes. Usually when you design a part, you need a lot of different parts because they, they, even if more if the, the part is complex, you will need to, to create a different part and then assemble them. So one complex uh, industrial piece like a engine, like turbine or any part uh, really is made from many, many other parts that are assembled together. With 3D printing, you can completely re-change re completely this design. You can actually print um, directly a complex part. So you can have a, a part that has, you know, internal cooling system. You can have a part that has um, moving modular parts inside it. You can decide that you're going to put a more dense, dense material on, on one part and less on this part. You can remove a lot of mat material that you use by having very um, organic shapes. So all these, um, these things around design for, uh, for additive manufacturing really completely uh, re require a change of mentality. You really change your mindset. You have to really learn the special specificities of 3D printing to be able to really design parts. And that's also a reason, I would say, why um, there was this uh, big um, 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 kind of de deception like where, where the makers uh, started like something surge, like something that we see a lot on Thingiverse, for example, like the platform where people share 3D printed files, is that you see a lot of, of files that are available, but they are actually just a copy of an existing product. So, for example, I see a lot of um, boxes for, you know, Raspberry Pi or anywhere, like boxes. 3D printing is not good at printing large, flat surfaces like a box. This is designed for injection molding processes. 
right? Like a lot of the world around us is made of squares of boxes because that's the way the machine works. That's how it shapes our world. And 3D printing is, can shape, a, shape a, a completely different world when you don't need to think inside a box. You can really rethink the way you design parts uh, in a much more organic way, maybe with a better cooling system. You don't need to put material as much as before. So like that, there is still, I would say, uh, even more in the maker community, like a really a need for rethinking the parts uh, for 3D printing. Um, another interesting part, I would say, is distributed manufacturing. Uh, we, as with the, the COVID uh, pandemic, like we saw, as, as you all, I'm sure, followed, like the, the actual in amazing experiment, uh, giant world experiment around distributed manufacturing, where uh, makers from all across the world started to uh, want to help out at uh, the beginning of the pandemic and try to find solutions and how to help out. And 3D printing became this very useful tool where locally you could produce parts um, and you can uh, send your designs, improve the design on each other and actually print parts locally to be able to help um, local uh, health professionals, for example. So you saw like the, the face shield, things like that. Again, that's, that was, um, um, that's, that was for the first time in history, like a giant um, trial on at doing distributed manufacturing. And what we saw, like tons of learning came from this. And I think it was a brilliant prototype of what could come next. Um, for example, the idea of, um, of uh, quality control, because if everybody is printing in their local makerspace, like how do you make sure that the part is actually um, compliant for, for health purposes, even more in, the, in that specific case? Um, so quality control was a big one. Uh, also, how do you um, actually um, um, also relocalize um, um, material access to materials? Um, like that, that was something that was instantly um, a complex a complexity. But what we saw is that there was there is a re today like a potential backbone of local manufacturers that could be able to uh, to produce locally. I would say one thing is that um, there is often a mix between what a, a desktop, desktop 3D printer like the one behind me can do and usually what the, the type of printer that makers have, which is really designed for prototyping, uh, and what uh, actual industry can do. Like when you see additive manufacturing technologies, you can actually print uh, super complex parts made of metal that are used uh, you know, in, in planes nowadays. So there is often a confusion between what can 3D printing do and what we actually, us as citizens, have access to. So that's something also to consider. And so we, we saw the rise, for example, of uh, manufacturing platforms like, uh, like Hubs, for example, that um, uh, is really exploding. This idea of distributed manufacturing with industrial capabilities. Um, so those are things that we are going to see more and more in the future, I would say the design for additive manufacturing parts. So there is a huge, um, huge need. I also want to take this opportunity to uh, do a call really for makers, like to, to start really thinking, what could I do with additive manufacturing? There is a lot of possibilities with applications with 3D printing that are really never seen before. Uh, and I think instead of focusing on actual equipment, like the printers, like I think it's, it's a terrible idea today to, to create a new 3D printer uh, or, you know, like there is all, like the infrastructure is there now, like the actors are, are, are pro, like they, they are really providing good equipment. I think there is a lot of work to be done on applications. What do we do with this 3D printing possibilities? And that's when there is so much to do. And I think that that's, that's really could be a, uh, like a game changer, uh, even more really with questions like climate change, for example. Um, and so we saw it also with this COVID, um, the distributed uh, network uh, of, uh, of face shields. There was the first phase of this uh, initiative was to ask yourself, like there was this huge, R&D, right, between makers from all over, the, all over the world to say, okay, we have the machines, we want to help, what do we make? And so there was a lot of proposal, like should we 3D print masks, should we 3D print 
um, you know, tools to open doors. Like uh, there was all this big brainstorm of what potential applications we could have that could help. And face shield became kind of the solution, like something that you can 3D print that uh, is uh, certainly helpful. So, so that that's how it came down to face shield. But what about if we do that for everything else? Like the world is is filled with products that are made on the other side of the world that consume tons of, of carbon and that could really be impacted by this. So this, this, um, this, this work needs to be done not only on the, okay, can we actually produce locally, but also the early phase of the, of the 3D printing, right? Which is really designing, thinking of applications that really understand the specificities of 3D printing and that activate that. Good afternoon, Oba. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me, Gerardi, on this session. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you begin by telling us a little bit about the general work that you do at Phil Square? How did you decide to found it and what kind of innovation space is it? Yes, yeah, so we're a research and development center and um, the, um, the center is focused basically on building innovation um, for um, the continent for communities across the continent and the goal is to enhance productivity um, of the next generation of Africans um, on African soil. So we're looking at in the next 30 years that the innovation that comes out of Bill Square would impact on um, the kind of lives which we live in communities across Africa. So you're really working with young people who are trying to come up with their own solutions, trying to build their own sort of digital paths and you're doing a lot in the yeah provision of of learning opportunities i think you did this especially also during the pandemic in a digital way can you introduce us to vault school and how you're currently managing it yes yeah, so um during the pandemic we um realized that we had millions of children who at out of school um as a result of the lockdown and um we at the time, we're working on an online learning platform for um, communities, for schools in Nigeria. And so we said, okay, is it possible for us to open up that to the rest of West Africa uh, and be able to support continuous learning while the students are at home? And so we launched Vote School, which is a digital learning platform to um, basically provide STEM, STEM learning um, digital materials um, for students from um, in, in high school, so from grade 7 up to grade 12. And um, we launched this in April and um, we were completely um, excited about the momentum we took up um, sometime in November when we um, crossed our first 2,000 students on the platform and how it grew beyond just the five countries in um, West Africa, which we thought it would be focused on, to now um, over nine countries um, across the continent. That's an amazing success. You launched in April last year, and this is everything you've managed to scale already within one year, especially this year of the pandemic, reaching so many children. So as I said, this is the story of a maker microscope. So this is a little bit the background of how you're operating the innovation hub, the school you set up and how you managed to do this digitally also during the last year. So tell me a little bit, um, where did you first come across this microscope <laughs> that is at the heart of our story today? Yes, yeah, so um, in 2019, I, I was on the conference in New Orleans in U in US, and um, at the time, we I, I hadn't had any direct um, interface with um, the microscope or thinking around the microscope, and um, we had this meeting with um, um, Shannon, who was who is a member of the public lab, and um, we got talking and just started sharing any experiences and ideas. And then from there, we decided to collaborate. Um, and just after then, um, we, we started working on how we could extend the community microscope, the public lab community microscope to um, the Nigerian setting. And so from there, we were able to get the initial um, concept of how these microscopes could actually help um, local context in Africa. 
And so we took the microscopes, we started trying to do some community engagement um, programs with it. Um, however, when we, when we launched the microscope with the communities, they rea we rea quickly realized that they, they didn't just need microscopes that were uh, more or less like build kits. Um, they wanted microscopes which they could get off the shelf. And so we started iterating um, the existing open source um, community microscope by Public Lab and um, evolved it from both the software down to the external casing, packaging, and every single thing that um, we have right now with the microscope. Okay, take, let's take another little step back. So you found this open source blueprint, which is really a, a microscope that's been replicated around the world in different maker spaces and used in different settings to do all kinds of research. And maybe you can just quickly loop us back in when you said you saw different kinds of use cases, how this could also be meaningful for your community. So why is it important for people to have access to something like a microscope? And what were the use cases that you saw in your community? Yes, one of the very important things for us, which um, we saw with the microscope, was down to a research which we were running earlier on in 2018. Sometime in 2018, we came up with this hypothesis where we said to ourselves that um, why is it that the African research isn't contributing to Africans' own development? And why is it that we need to depend on international aid, international support, even down to research or um, to, to, be able to, uh, uh, to be able to go by? And so we, we came up with this stats and we realized 12.5% of the world population are Africans. And out of the global contribution to research, Africa only contributes less than 1%. And this was really shocking for us. And so we said to ourselves that now we have the microscope, is it possible for us to contribute to increasing that percentage contribution of research on the global scale and, um, in, and on the long run contribute to quality healthcare, contribute to education, contribute to you know, national security, contribute to so many uh, aspects of the continent. And so this was a very, very good use case for us. Um, if we could give researchers low cost, you know, lab equipment that would quickly accelerate their research processes, then that would be great news. That would be great opportunity for us to actually you know, contribute to all other sectors across the continent. Right, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess this is true along different um, sort of, yeah, different communities, as you were explaining, research communities trying to come up with their own data, but also kids learning how to research and getting in this mindset that you might be also the collector of data and how to manage and store that. So sort of along the whole journey of junior researcher to people working in an um, academic context. So then, as you said, you found this microscope open source as a maker product. And those of us who work in maker communities will understand how special this is because it's not that often that something that starts out as an open source blueprint like that makes it onto the shelf of a shop. So how did you go around sort of iterating this product design and and working on it until it was something that you could supply as this kind of off-the-shelf product. Yes. Yeah, so um, as I said, initially what we did is was to to do a, a massive field test. So we brought in community members, we brought in professors from the university, we brought in you know high school teachers, we brought in students, you know freshman students, and we brought in kids who were in primary school, you know, um, to interact with this existing open source uh, um, um, microscope which you had access to and then they came up with a couple of designs so they kept iterating the designs and different materials um, for example this is the first stage where we started from so this is the volt microscope and um, basically it's made from wood and this was the first design they came up with where they could come up with um, wooden material where it could be protected um, came up with um, the, 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 the sample bed here and um, this concept of how to um, hold the lighting source that it was useful. Um, this was more or less after many, many, uh, this was after many, this was after many, many iterations of, of development, which they arrived at this. And 
um, that was the first step. The, after that step was for us to um, put this out and, and put it in test, um, test schools and see, would you buy this? Would you pay to, you know, to have this in your lab? And then it was quite interesting for us to realize that it costs you nothing less than $500 um, to up to $2,000 to get a good quality microscope in a lab, right? And that is the reason why most labs across Nigeria and even across Africa um, have only one and they cage it like a museum. So you go and just say, oh, that's the microscope, that's the eyepiece, but you don't get to engage with it, right? So what we decided to do was, is it possible for us to give it at a low cost while um, still delivering the same um, average quality that you would get for a $500, uh, 500 euros microscope? And, um, and that was what we did. So we realized that the real core thing was the cost. Um, most people were ready to pay if it was cheaper because then you can have more units. So instead of spending cost on $500 for um, one microscope, you can possibly get 10 microscopes. So that made more sense to them. Um, and that was just easier for them to relate with. So we took all this learning, took it back into the lab, we crunched it and came up with a more um, refined structure of what the microscope is. Um, we packaged it. So we thought about everything from the packaging, um, from the packaging down to um, how it's arranged, you know, to the manuals. Uh, we, we, we first of all started with very big manuals and then we later realized that um, we could also keep the cost low by making the manuals really easy um, to use and um, simple to understand. Um, we also thought about it because at some point it was like, oh, um, we, we need other additional things like replacement consumables and things like that. So someone within the community came up with a resource kit. So we could have a resource kit where we just have a bunch of things like cords, like, uh, like um, gloves, like uh, dropping pipettes, like clips, you know, and all sorts of things, um, which people, you can just keep adding more and more things as the microscope keeps evolving to the resource kit. Then the microscope itself evolved um, from the first stage down to this. And so now you have this, which is what it is now, but this was what it was before. And then you can see the evolve, how it's evolved from it being wood to it being plastic now or entirely. So we started thinking about how, what is the sustainable way of um, manufacturing uh, large quantities of the microscope um, on plastic. So we started thinking around acrylic and um, um, laser cutting and things like that. And that's just the summary of all the different processes. <laughs> yeah. And okay, I have a bunch of questions. So first of all, it's great to hear, of course, how you went in about this in sort of true makerspace fashion in terms of considering all the UX aspects and really developing this product together with the users in your community. I would love to learn how are you producing it now? Is this something that you able to do locally and that you're also doing within the capacity of Ville Square or what's the production mechanism like? Yes, yeah, so um, currently we do um, most of the fabrication locally. Um, we do it within Ville Square. So we, um, we have the sheets which we, we don't make the acrylic sheets. So we import those sheets into, into Nigeria but we run the sheets under our um, laser cutting machines and cut them into the sizes where we want them to be. Uh, and then from there, we take it to, um, we, we hire people who do not have so much expertise or skill, um, but they have IT, uh, IT skills. Um, so they um, gum the, the different parts together to make it into a box. And um, that box which uh, um, you, you have um, can now then house all the other components of the microscope. Um, every other thing, like if you like from noticing it here, we have all reusable. So this is some band, right? Which you could like get off on Amazon. Um, and this is some, some, some like uh, some screws which we um, partnered with a school company to ship them to us in, in large quantities. And then we um, basically fit everything together and put in the board in, which we also um, 
basically using the open source tool, we basically can get that, you know, from Amazon or any of these different platforms. And then we ship them in there and we put everything together and um, get the microscope running. We had the real, um, we had the real um, transformation happens is on the image processing. So what we've done is that because we have a lot of expertise in building um, a high performance software, so we've spent time um, building drivers for the boat microscope. We spent time, you know, building advanced image processing tools for the um, for the for the for the ice the, the chips and all the and the board on on on, on the microscope. So um, so yeah, so basically that, uh, and um, the packaging, we designed the, the box. So we design everything, we buy the sheets in flat base sheets. So they come in flat, flat pack sheets. And then we, um, we also have to engineer this, right? So we couldn't get a box that was brown. So we had to figure out how to get it white and brown here. So we would like lay um, large, um, sh um, large uh, sheets of stickers on this, and then we cut it under the um, the, the laser cut to get out the shape. So, um, so yes, so basically most of everything uh, is, uh, I would say 60, 70% done in house. Um, we also get raw materials from um, outside the country locally to also support the production process. If ever anybody needed a story that would underline how an open source design can create local jobs or lead to local economic development, I think you just delivered it perfectly. I have at least two more questions. So if I am a student in Nigeria now, I can go into a supermarket and buy your microscope. How much would I pay for it? And how would you explain to somebody who's not visited a school in Nigeria why this is such a game changer? Yes. Um, so if you're a student, you walk into a store. Currently, it goes for $41 um, um, in the store that comes in the box, um, complete with the kits, with the, um, the manuals. And then we also have like sample slides, um, which you can also get um, um, in the kit. Um, why is this important? Uh, as I said, um, education is one key thing uh, that can transform any society. Um, we at Deal Square, we like to see um, access to education as, as, as national security. Um, and I will explain what that means. So if you have access to education, for example, good education, then you can contribute to research coming out of that country. And if you can contribute to research coming out of that country, let's take a sector such as healthcare. You can contribute to the quality of healthcare in rural communities across the country. You can ensure that citizens' lives are safe. So you can ensure that citizens have access to emergency services, have access to basic healthcare in no matter, in, no, no, in, in, in wherever place they are across the country. And so we see education as the foundation to national development, to national security, to advancement of a country of the continent. And that is why um, we, we take it very seriously at Bill Square. And something else which is really important is when you talk about science research, um, access to quality um, um, lab equipment, it's also very important because ideally most of these equipments are really expensive to have access to. So most students can't even have access to them in their lifetime of working as researchers. Um, we took a poll, for example, when we were doing this research, we went to universities and we asked them for, um, to give us the cost of equipment in the lab they use. And only out of 10, um, researchers, only one researcher could say that microscope cost X amount or that, or that PCR cost X amount. Why? Because most African researchers don't buy lab equipment. It's too expensive. To give you some context into that, the um, daily spending uh, uh, capacity or limit, uh, you know, in, a, in, in, in most African countries is less than $2. So um, if someone is earning at the end of the month, all their earnings is $150 or $200, for example. 
and that is a high earning person, right? But someone who, who can only spend $2 a day. So if you do $2 times 30 days, that is $60 they have access to throughout the whole month, right? It's difficult for them to take in $500 or $1,000 or $2,000 to invest into you know, an equipment. That's like a whole year's salary. So we looked at this math and we said to ourselves that if we can offer um, research like this, um, for instance, this is the microscope. We're looking at other things like PCRs and all the other um, lab equipment. If we can offer, you know, equipments like this to students across not just Nigeria but across Africa, then we immediately give an edge. We we give um, students a, the the opportunity to actually say, oh, we can contribute to society or we can contribute to advancing, you know, our individual countries. We are not just in Nigeria. We're also in Togo. We are in some universities in Togo. Yes, we're in some universities in Togo, and we've also started shipping recently to South Africa, Kenya, and uh, some parts of Uganda. So, um, and and the, 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 the opportunities are just limitless um, when thinking about um, the, what this can do in our society. So my, my last question is what's next? And also if people are listening to this and they got excited and would like to work in some kind of way with you, then where can they be in touch? I know you're part of many networks. Luckily, you're also part of the Global Innovation Gathering and the Africa Open Science and Hardware Community. And um, is there anywhere else you'd like to point people to check out more of your work? You also have a session tomorrow, or at least you have a session in the Republica program coming up on, on homeschooling around the world. So yeah, what's next and any place you want to point people to find out more about your work? Yes, um, so everything we do is on the ViewSquare website, viewsquare.org. Um, and most of the work uh, on the microscope is viewsquare.org slash vote. And, um, so yes, the next steps for us is we're trying to build in more technology into this, um, such that we have some AI um, vision um, model, where if you put a sample over it, it's able to um, say, oh, okay, this is a plant cell, or this is this, and label all the different parts on it. So you don't need an expert to be able to um, do exploratory science. So that's one step for us. The second step for us is we're, um, currently looking at possibilities to um, partner with um, hospitals um, to start exploring this in their, um, in their labs, um, to do research such as um, blood counts, you know, and trying to look at um, the shape of um, um, uh, 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 an sickle cell, um, looking at things like um, typhoid, diagnosing typhoid um, in saliva, and a lot of other interesting research with this. So we're, we're looking at point of care healthcare uh, tool with this um, both microscope. So that's the next phase which we're also looking at. And the goal is to put this in every primary healthcare center across um, Africa. And that's the high goal. We'll first start with Nigeria and um, see who um, is able to come along um, to join us on this. So yes, uh, so those are the next That's step. an amazing plan. I'm looking forward to seeing it roll out. And I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Our next session is a statement talk. It's gonna be given by Reem Tahuk, who is the Vice Chancellor Research Fellow at the School of Design and Center for International Development at Northumbria University. She's gonna deconstruct the terms resilience and innovation, in particular in regard to how we use them in contexts of refugee communities and the demands and expectations put on them. August 4th, 2020, was the day of the Beirut port explosion that devastated the city and injured and killed hundreds. In the aftermath of the explosion, friends from the West got in touch to grieve with me, but also to say, Lebanese are resilient and will recover. When they would say that I was screaming on the inside, no Habibi, we do not want to be resilient. In 2010, 
the humanitarian system realized that things are simply not working. And humanitarian organizations turned towards innovation and the concept of resilience. Resilience is the ability of individuals, household, communities, and nations to anticipate, respond to, and recover from shocks and stressors like conflict. Some organizations, like the International Federation of Red Cross and Crescent, stressed that community resilience should maintain a focus on underlying vulnerabilities, and that recovery from shocks should not compromise long-term prospects of a community. That all sounds good, right? Who will ever say that communities should not be able to respond and recover from conflict, from displacement, from an explosion? No one. But what are the implications of the concept of community resilience on the ground? What narrative of humanitarianism is it propagating? And equally, where does innovation fit into this? Well, Duffield and Evans and Reed have all pointed out how implementing resilience and humanitarianism is problematic. In essence, when we are telling communities to be resilient, what we are doing is shifting the responsibility of responding to crises from states and humanitarian organizations to already vulnerabilized communities. We are also telling communities to shift their focus from structural inequalities to focus on anticipating shocks and stressors and preparing for them, rather than focusing on the day-to-day -day erosion of their capabilities and freedoms. By saying that communities should always be preparing for shocks and stressors, we are enforcing a dystopian way of being. A being that is always focused on something bad happening, rather than a narrative that is aspiration-based and focused on building communities that flourish. Here, you might say, Reem, isn't this just philosophical and theoretical speculation? Well, not really. When talking with Syrian refugees in Lebanon about how they characterize their resilience, they all said that resilience is survival. Resilience is accepting reality, a reality in which they have no choice. A reality where they know that if they as a community try to take action to be resilient, in a way that they want to be resilient, they would be told, you can't do that. This is not your country. So how does technology and innovation fit into all of this? Well, let's take a few examples from my research. When Eshraf, an unaccompanied young asylum seeker in Austria is struggling with mental health, he attempts to access an already underfunded and overwhelmed mental health service. While waiting for a month or more for his appointment, the service recommends a mental health app that is popular and well-rated in the Google Play Store. Here we see a technology being part of a mechanism that is shifting the responsibility of addressing his mental health solely to him, rather than being a responsibility for him and a service provider. The technology is there to help him cope until the system can support him. But when Eshraf tries to use the app, he finds that the app is not designed for him, is not designed for asylum seekers. And here we're not just talking about the language. We're talking about the environment and resources that the app designers assumed their users would have. For example, the app tells Eshraf that when he's having difficulty sleeping, he should work on separating the social and work spaces in his home from his sleeping space. How is Eshraf supposed to do that? when he has been assigned to live in housing where he shares a room with three other asylum seekers that socialize in that room. So here we're not only seeing a shift in responsibility, but also the wider system asking an asylum seeker to be resilient while imposing migration policies that contribute to structural inequalities. Eshref is being asked to change when the system is unwilling to change. Is this not dystopian? Now, Eshref is an individual, but what about resilience at a community level? In a rural town in Lebanon, a group of Syrian refugee women living in an informal settlement meet every afternoon over coffee. They discuss their situation and exchange tips on how to secure food for their family. 
You see, the Lebanese government has imposed so many barriers for their husbands to secure a stable source of income. But they do receive food aid. And the World Food Program that provides that aid has fully embraced technologies and innovation. Before, refugees would have to go every month to receive a food aid box, but now they don't have to do that. A refugee initially meets with an aid worker that assesses their food security and vulnerability, and if eligible, signs them up for the electronic voucher system. They don't, they don't have to see the aid worker for months to get their aid. This is great, it is more dignified. But here, the technology is a technology of abandonment. The aid worker is now distanced from refugees. The amount of contact between refugees and aid workers is reduced. So how does the e-voucher system work? A refugee is given a debit card that the World Food Program tops up with money every month. The refugee can use this card to only buy food from a select number of shops that are usually owned by Lebanese. Again, here we see another form of shifting of responsibility. The shopkeeper is now the gatekeeper of the food aid rather than the humanitarian organization. In theory, the model is great. Refugees are given freedom of choice in food products, it is more dignified, and the Lebanese economy benefits, especially local shop owners. But in reality, it is much different. The shifting in responsibility mediated by the e-voucher system created space for refugees to experience racism and discrimination by Lebanese shop owners that would sometimes abuse the low technology literacy of refugees that have never used a debit card before. Shop owners would increase their prices because they know that refugees cannot go to another shop that's registered with the World Food Program to buy food. And they increased their prices for engaging in risky transactions that enabled refugees to buy non-food products using their food aid and the e-voucher system. My research points to the fact that by situating a technology in a specific space, while ignoring the racism Lebanese in that area have towards Syrians, while ignoring that Lebanese shop owners are also on the brink of poverty themselves results in these experiences. By enabling these spaces, the technology is enforcing the status quo of discrimination against refugees. Now let's take this a step further and go back to our group of women that are meeting over coffee. They discuss how in an ideal world where they had cash available to them, they can form a collective a collective that negotiates with shop owners on prices and buys in bulk so that they can all benefit from discounted prices. This is a form of resilience, is it not? Is it not a community that is taking action to respond to their crisis of food insecurity and displacement? Is it not a form of resilience that challenges the status quo by positioning them as a collective with agency to negotiate? But does the e-voucher enable it? The answer is no. The technology enforces the narrative of refugees being viewed as a household or individual and not a community of action. By not enabling refugees to pool money available in their e-vouchers for collective purchasing. Shop owners are even advised when using this technology not to sell in bulk because what if a refugee is benefiting from a bulk discount and is then portioning it up and selling it at a cheaper price than the shop owner? The technology is designed to secure that aid is used in the way promised to funders. And this happens at the expense of refugees practicing their collective agency. Therefore, the technology is a tool through which we are reinforcing a narrative that says that refugees cannot take collective action when engaging with other actors. And this is in line with the narrative that is part of the system of oppression practiced by the Lebanese state. When refugees wanted to elect a committee of representatives for each settlement that would liaise with the local Lebanese government, this was not allowed. And instead, local politicians selected a refugee from each settlement to be a liaison. So what we see from these examples is resi resilience being kept at the level of survival rather than, rather than that of flourishing. 
Resilience as coping with what is given, rather than resilience taking the form of collective action, community organization, and the practicing of agency in everyday interactions. And technologies are enforcing this dystopian narrative of resilience, a resilience that is not leading to transformational change. So the question I want to end on that I hope we can all reflect on throughout today and the conference is, how can we design technologies for resilience that create a space for flourishing, a space for working towards challenging the status quo and doing so move away from the dystopian futures that are being enforced on refugees? Thank you. In this next session, Tarek Omar from the Cairo Hackerspace is going to introduce to you what he has been working on in the meantime, especially when so many of us couldn't visit our local makerspace. Come with us on a little demo and journey to discover the remote lab. Hi Tarek, great to have you here. <laughs> Hi Geraldine, thank you. I would love to ask you to begin by giving us a demonstration of what you mean when you say remote control lab and introduce us to Senate Lab, please. Okay, so uh, let me begin by uh, sharing the screen and uh, going to uh, right to the Senate Lab website. So Senate Lab is a platform uh, that we built at Cairo Hackerspace uh, the, related to the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, when it started, we couldn't uh, begin uh, doing workshops or events or any of what we do. And a lot of people were asking us to, uh, they needed hardware and we thought about lending hardware. We thought about the mobile makerspace we did before and not, nothing worked in that setting. But then we remember something we thought of a long time ago, which is we, we were thinking about sharing our lab uh online and and also shared with other countries and we were thinking about like if every hacker space or a maker space uh, are able to to share some of their uh, instruments uh, for students and makers and hackers everywhere in the world so they can learn on it uh, a lot of things doesn't really need you have the hardware in hand uh, mostly it, you program it you monitor it you control it uh related to most experiments so we started senate lab uh, it's still in development. This is like right now, like early beta. And uh, the, the whole idea of it is to, to have the hardware easily shared and controlled from anywhere in the world. So we thought about what would make the, 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 the process easy, which, and the first thing we thought of, we get a lot of people in the hacker space who does not even have computers and they want to use our own computer. So we thought everyone have either phones or tablets. So why don't they have a virtual machine on the cloud that they can create uh, this? So I'm going to show you right now. The first thing we did was we created an online virtual machine. So uh, I'm going to, I hope I wrote that right. Republica, okay, let's actually make it very correct. Uh, Republica 21. And then I'm creating a virtual machine right now. It's Ubuntu. It's it's a version of Linux, and this is what most engineers and scientists and developers and people learning uh, use. And basically, you can do anything that you would do on Mac or Windows. Most things. So I'm gonna just like that. I'm gonna create a new machine. And let's imagine right now I'm uh, I'm the teacher or the professor, or the or the person who's doing the workshop. And right now I just created the virtual machine. And then once I set up this virtual machine, I can go, it's like, it's like computer, it's like desktop. I can go inside, I can set up my examples, I can set up software that the students, uh, they will use. And I'm gonna just make a quick example here of let's say uh, Visual Studio Code. This is something familiar to people who know that they, they use it to, to, to do programming. So if I have an online lesson for people to do, to learn Python programming and do, or do AI, uh, uh, we can actually use this and once, once I am done uh, setting up uh, my examples, I can save it and set up all the hardware and save it. I'm gonna go back quickly to show you something before I go to the hardware. 
I can actually come here as a professor and I can allow this machine to be cloned or collaboration, right? So mainly the cloning right now. And I, I was I send this code to my students. I am I actually use this personally. I have I have about 10 students I teach online and I use this platform with them in hardware and software. So when I send them this container, they are able to clone my virtual machine with everything I had in there and they have all the examples and everything set up. The collaboration feature, we have it for our students. Let's say my student have a problem. So when they check this and they send me their code of their own virtual machine, I am able to actually go inside and we both are collaborating on the same machine. So we, it's like Google Documents, uh, for example, where multiple people can uh, join. So I do use that feature with actually one of my students that I teach uh, Python programming language. And every lesson we collaborate on one machine and we work together to learn that. The main feature, which is the remote lab. Uh, this is a lab also, uh, but the main feature is attaching hardware. So we made it very easy uh, for anyone who have an account on Senate Lab to download the Raspberry Pi image. So everyone, uh, a lot of people know Raspberry Pi single board computer. And uh, just by one click, when you go there, device manager, when you click request image, you will get just a file. You download that file on your SD card, put it in the Raspberry Pi, and then I'm gonna go back here quickly. Sorry, I'm going too quickly. And then anything I connect into the USB port for that Raspberry Pi will actually appear here, or I can share it. It also has a code. I can just send that code, like the virtual machine code to my student, and then they will be able to do that. So here I have sample codes for uh, two of my colleagues working with me uh, for their own Raspberry Pi and whatever they are uh, using. So this is a Raspberry Pi right now that has an experiment uh, that uh, related to motors, okay, to, to learn how to control motors with uh, with uh, with a PWM signal. So I'm not gonna I'm, go, I'm not gonna go into the technical terms right now, but it's it's how you do it's like modulation, how to make a signal to control uh, how fast the motor rotates. Uh, the speed and the direction of that. And uh, right now, it's it, the camera is going to, it should appear right now, hopefully. That's what happens in uh, the demos. So yeah, as you can see, the camera right now appeared. I'm gonna show you exactly what you see here. I'm gonna uh, do this so everything is clear. So right now I have, I have the camera. Uh, this is the motor right now. And I am going to, leave this so this is right now i can light around let's say this is a lecture and i'm showing you an example and then later at any time during the week night morning you can just go attach the machine and try to do the assignment i gave you an example the assignment and i told you like hey using what you learned in the classroom right now i want you to program this circuit it looks messy a little bit so uh yeah until the program opens i'll tell you what exactly we have here so what we have here is like this is an oscilloscope, it's a digital oscilloscope. Uh, and this is the motor with a, with a propeller, actually a drone propeller. And this is a power supply that's supplying power to the propeller. And uh, what do you see here is the software uh, that, generates, uh, that generates the wave and that uh, can control the motor. So right now I am going to turn on the motor uh so the motor is actually so these switches i'm just i will tell you quickly uh, what is this so right now i'm just this is this determines the direction of uh the motor so and right now the motor uh i think it should uh, turn into uh clockwise so let me just make this a little bigger mm -mm. okay let's get this out of the screen uh, like this, and then we can generate right now the pulse. So it when it when the motor receives the pulse, it is going to turn. It should. Okay. The motor is not turning. There is a pulse. Okay. I think I have uh, changed the. Uh, I have changed something. The power. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. I see. The pulse is too weak. So let's change the pulse here. Okay, I don't see the motor turning, but it works. 
<laughs> so uh, I think it's uh, that the, I change it uh, something here. Okay, so yeah, from here. So basically, uh, the, the to make the motor rotate, we need to send uh, the motor uh, a specific pulse. Uh, and and as you can see here, this is the pulse uh, that the motor is getting. And this pulse should be five volts. So it's five volts on and off, on and off quickly. And that determines how fast the motor rotates. And uh, when I run, I click run here. It should make uh, the motor uh, rotate. And sorry about that. So here. So here that determines in this area, that determines uh, the direction of where where the motors uh, should uh, the direction of the motor i can uh, change uh, the speed right now i'm gonna make this window away as you can see all of these windows are in the browser right now and this is similar to on a tablet or a phone and this is this is like game streaming if you, if anyone hears about game streaming right now we are doing the same we are streaming the keyboard and the mouse back to the cloud and you get this uh, view streamed back to you. And you can install any software uh, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this setting. So basically right now, as it, what happened is the camera is going to stop uh, right now. And this is a good feature we created so that the students can have queues. So right now, as you can see, I mounted this and now it got unmounted after 300 seconds. And the reason is, if we have a hundred, if I'm if I'm teaching right now and we have ten students, they can get their turns in the queue, and I can have this experiment like four of them or three of them, and that's actually what I do with my students. Sometimes I have multiple students and I have only one experiment, but I leave it on forever, just plug it in and go to sleep, and don't have to worry about it. So I'm gonna mount it again, and as you can see, mount it for three hundred seconds. I'm just going to close this and open it again, so it can. Uh, and then the camera, it's going to come right now. So yeah, basically that's that's one experiment. I can show you also another experiment with Arduino. So yeah, I did this like a quick uh, a quick demo. As you can see, the motor is uh, turning. I mean, yeah, this is yeah, this is basically like summary of of it. It's working, and you can plug in anything. You can plug in any kind of experiment or like something you would need just to monitor the data and you need a specific software for it. And you can do this remotely. I, I use this even at work. And sometimes at work, at my, my day job, I uh, do uh, some, uh, so I, I build escape rooms and I build exhibits. And these things sometimes break. And uh, sometimes it's impossible for me to go and I don't even have my laptop. So I leave a Raspberry Pi there with the OS. Once they just plug into the Raspberry Pi and put the USB in, I have full access and I can see uh, everything happening. I can just uh, program it or debug it or change it or do anything. So, yeah. Thank you so much for the brilliant demonstration, Tarek. It's great to see Senate Lab in action. Thank you very much. Oh, let me stop the share. Okay. Yeah, I would love to ask you a couple of questions to follow up your presentation with. So I think you explained so well in the beginning, the inspiration point, like during COVID, you were in a city where it was a really difficult situation for a long time and people couldn't really go anywhere. So it's clear where your sort of point of departure came from. I would love to learn from you what your hopes are for Senate Lab, how you think it's going to be in effect to give more people perhaps access to these kind of yeah educational opportunities and learn spaces than previously you've had? Yeah, as, as I said before, we had that exact problem for a long time and, and talking with, with my friend in the gigs, uh, like friends in the, in the gig uh, network and mostly the same problem exists in a lot of African countries, uh, which is it's hard to get uh, the, the experiments, the hardware, there is a lot of things that are open source, but not everything is open source. And even building the open source things, you cannot do everything. Some hardware is experiment is expensive. In 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 case of Egypt, for example, I cannot get old hardware. Uh, the the price also like the very cheap things like the Arduino is right now very expensive in Egypt because of the the difference in the price and the economy and all of that. So even the very cheap things that you can say it's like $1 or $2. It, it is actually now challenging uh, for the education 
reason. And most of these things, you don't actually need the hardware in your hand. So we, it was the time, it, like we had the time right now to build it uh, of, of a vision we saw long time before. We needed this. Uh, we, we tried, as I said before, we tried to help other places in Egypt to open hacker spaces. And one of the issues was, was there is no accessibility. And we tried to make the accessibility, but it didn't really work. The things need to be always there or needs to be always accessible. And, and right now I'm sharing my own hardware with my friends in Cairo Hackerspace and also my students uh, everywhere, like in the US or, or Europe or, or in Egypt. Right, so it's not just something that's to be used during the pandemic and in the times where we can't necessarily go to our makerspace or hackerspace of choice, but also especially to create access for people who don't get to go to this, such kind of spaces at all or that are under equipped. I think this is such a beautiful continuation of some of the work that you've been doing, as you mentioned really briefly, um, you set up Cairo Hackerspace, but also put that in a mobile van to take it to places where people didn't have access to the space that you were providing inside a capital city center. And now taking that to the virtual realm to give even more people access, I think, yeah, like I said, is a beautiful continuation of that. And like you rightly pointed out, some of the people in our network live in countries where you have up to 400% import tax for hardware and even smaller devices like Arduino's or Raspberry Pis that seem generally affordable can become hugely expensive in a setting like that. Yeah, so, that's, uh, that's correct. Um, how, how are you developing it at the moment? Um, you said it's in better, better mode. And what are the next steps for Senate Lab? So uh, currently, the whole, all the team uh, working on Senate Lab are Cairo Hackerspace members. Uh, and yeah, as I said, the, the, the reason we wanted to do that because we don't want to... We, we have been through a lot in Cairo Hackerspace, uh, like uh, a lot of extreme things. And this this was like we are trained right now. So we never stopped. So that why we instantly started working on that. So it's the Hackerspace team working on that. Uh, a lot of the developers... Uh, that working right now on Senate Lab are actually interns. Some of them, it was the first time ever writing code. And I, I did that because I was like, if that project failed, at least someone got the benefit. And this is the mission of Cairo Hackerspace. So we, we educate, we teach people uh, things from different uh, fields. The, the current state is, is that we are trying to make the main features more stable. The main features we have, which is like the virtual desktops uh, that you can spawn with one click or share or collaborate with uh, in one second, and also be able to share your own hardware, any any hardware, any hardware that you can plug with USB, uh, to be able to share that. We're trying to make that more stable and intuitive and easy as like one click. You can have your hardware shared with your students or other people. Uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and then we want to add extra features that are mainly targeted for uh, open science, uh, which is uh, like easier feature for AI and uh, monitoring science experiments. So you don't have to go inside a virtual machine and set up everything by your hand, but now you can have like a dashboard with the camera and that's it. So we, we will be moving into that after we this setting I showed uh, would be more stable. That's really exciting. I mean, I can imagine so many different ways that this can be used in future. And I maybe as a closing question, would just love to hear if people were listening to this and think like, oh, I wanna, I wanna use Senate Lab in my educational setting, or I wanna help develop this this product, then what's the what's the call to action? Can they get in touch with you? What would you say? Yeah, so we, we are actually right now <clears throat> to, to, so right now I'm the only user, actual real user for Scent Lab because I do actually use it with my students every week for the past three months. So we are, we are, I'm discovering new ways this could be helpful. I'm, every time I show it to someone, they tell me, oh, this could be good in this problem. This could solve that problem. Uh, and and uh, I'm looking right now for, for uh, organizations or people or spaces that would actually use this uh, as a beta testing in, in a real classroom setting. Like, like I, I'm looking for, for a real classroom setting so we can work on, on making the features 
uh, more stable. And uh, I can uh, be uh, like, yeah, you can just send an email to info at senatelab.com. Uh, and uh, I will be responding uh, to you. And yeah, that's that's what we are looking for. And we are also looking for support or funding because this project we have been working on uh, for the past year, since since uh, since like we started actual development in May 2020, and it was all volunteer work uh, and and uh, and personal funding. So uh, right now it did actually slow down a little bit uh, because uh, we ran out of funding and. Uh, uh, some some of the people working on it are students, so they are trying to keep up with their uh, studies also. So, uh, yeah, so uh, we're looking also for funding and beta testers. I hope a lot of people get in touch after they heard the session and watched the session. And I just want to say thank you for the amazing work you're doing. I so look forward to see where this is going to go and hope to be part of the further journey. And thank you for being a member of the good community and taking part in this year's Republica program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Geraldine. In our next session, we're gonna take you on a little trip to South Asia to visit two spaces who are making sure that we don't slip straight from this pandemic into the next catastrophe and trying to do their share to combat climate change working with local communities, coming up with local solutions in order to avoid further crisis. So we're gonna take you to Nepal and Bhutan to discover climate action make spaces. So this is a uh, uh, Karma House 4.0. Uh, basically, it has been over the last uh, five, uh, six years right, that uh, we have been uh, uh, working and very closely uh, uh, looking into some of the existing challenges that we face and why we are doing this uh, uh, Karma House in honor and uh, uh, respect to the uh, uh, health, wealth, and environment. Uh, so. Uh, uh, here we will uh, share you uh, uh, why we are doing the Karma House uh, in the process, uh, how we are using the digital fabrication technology uh, to, to, uh, to build the local capacity as well as to build the uh, innovative uh, materials for this uh, building of the Karma House. And also some of the rationals that we are facing right now currently in Bhutan. So this is a Karma House is a country helix uh, collaboration, meaning that uh, we are, it's not enough that only the uh, Fab Lab or the Mecca community alone as in, as, uh, in silos are building this, but I think it's equally important also to look at overall government uh, plans so that whatever learning we have, we can actually you know, transfer that to uh, uh, as, uh, through the horizontal collaboration approach. So therefore, like uh, we also have uh, government officials who who are also uh, keen in supporting us and guiding us on this uh, to make this uh, successful uh, uh, cases uh, trial blazer uh, uh, building uh, cases in Bhutan. So the, our immediate challenge uh, uh, in Bhutan build environment is that like in, in environmental aspects, the, due to the rap, uh, rapid uh, urbanization, rural urban migrations, uh, right now uh, one of the biggest challenges is that like uh, most of the youths are from rural communities are flooding into the, uh, the urban areas, and within that, uh, the, all the, uh, due to the, the all the buildings that is coming up in the urban spaces, it is actually having a very uh, fatal. Uh, uh, challenges for the environment. It is degrading into local systems uh, throughout actually all these regions throughout Bhutan. We have around uh, 20 municipalities currently. Now, uh, when it comes to the energy, like uh, based on the uh, Bhutan energy efficiency baseline studies that was conducted, it has sh uh, shown that 48.7% of the energy consumptions are going into directly into the uh, building, uh, build environment. Uh, and likewise, uh, uh, currently some of the resources that we are using is like uh, the firewood and firewood also is a very uh, hazardous as per the World uh, uh, Health Organization.
and the what is Karma uh, Karma House is going to be the first of its kind in Bhutan, and uh, it, the whole idea of Karma House is to lead and accelerate the innovation demonstration and commercialization of green energy solution within the energy, water, metals consumption, and data by making powerful cases. So the powerful life cases is Karma House itself, and again it is. Uh, uh, it is not enough that we are doing it in and I think it has to be collaboration. That is the only way forward for every everybody, whether it's government agencies, private institutions, or research academies, right? So therefore, like uh, we have been successful to form the Quanta Alex uh, Innovation Playground. So the policy maker can also pay, uh, benefit from this karma house learning and journey, as well as academia and citizens can actually come and live and uh, feel uh, life, uh, how the karma house was uh, developed. Right. So for us, it's like if it's a policy maker, we transfer the ownership of the karma house to the policy maker in that region. If it's the academia, then they, they can all. So basically, we are trying to open up ourselves so that uh, the people, whoever with their respective backgrounds can own and feel the ownership of that journey. It's a process orientation, not a result orientation. So that is the important uh, 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 work of the work uh, that we are doing. So again, uh, in 2017, uh, uh, there was a field research that uh, from the Germany and the Bhutan government, uh, they have jointly conducted uh, uh, research on how is the energy consumption uh, in the Bhutan. So they have there uh, went to 10 different houses across Bhutan, uh, uh, and then they have made uh, uh, all the research. And based on that research and findings, so these are the 10 houses that they actually, they have looked into the traditional rent house, they have looked into the conventional uh, uh, buildings structure that is uh, 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 in Bhutan right now. And finding from this is like, there's like, uh, there's many findings, but above all is like uh, uh, the, the, the build envelope, building envelopes in Bhutan are not really sustainable, first of all, because it doesn't have some fixed uh, joints uh, uh, and insulations that is important to preserve the indoor uh, climate as well as, uh, you know, so, so when you look into these 10 findings, so we found out that uh, we have to come up with the adequate uh, skills and technology by using the, harnessing the power of technology and then uh, open source uh, uh, fabrications, then we can maybe build up the entire local uh, uh, skills as well as solve some of the uh, challenges that the built environment is uh, facing in Bhutan. So in that process, uh, uh, so Karma House, uh, in fact, uh, Karma Lagishi, uh, our director, she has been very supportive from the day one. Since 2000, uh, our, uh, this building Karma House is going to be a live demonstration. So we have the site located very in the middle of the center of the uh, urban area. So it is good for people to work in from the street, uh, uh, government officials to work in from their offices to see and you know, feel this. Uh, so it has been uh, five years on the journey. Here we even reached out to many international uh, research institutions. We have visited several different technologies hubs because for us collaboration and innovation is innovation is not all about inventing new worlds, rather looking into existing part of the world and and see if we could transfer some of that innovation to Bhutan, whether it is in other part of Europe or America or wherever it is. If you can collaborate that and then transfer that technology with uh, uh, respect to the nature culture. So this is why uh, we have uh, come up with this. So Karma House is going to be a multipurpose training center in the heart and we will have different uh, laboratories up and running. I think the, some of the things that uh, I'll share you two slides shows that what we are doing right now to build locally, manufacture everything and that was accumulated over engineering research that we have did it. So now in this Karma House, we are going to use the FabLab digital fabrication tools and uh, equipment. So here we are going to build the locally build it uh, solar integrators roof tanks in Bhutan. We are also going to develop a uh, wood tool slabs that is going to be integrated because all these materials are uh, uh, in abundance available in Bhutan. So now we are going to use this local available uh, things to, to, to use it in, uh, and apply that into the Karma House from solar roof tiles to the wood tool slabs. Even we are going to <clears throat> use the, uh, the old uh, uh, plumbing pipes that has been thrown out. We are going to uh, take that up and recycle that lens 
Now we are also looking into the, the hot water, smart hot water thing where we're going to integrate some of the, uh, the uh, technologies so that you know, it can be fast, uh, five to 10 times faster than the conventional. At the same time, it is going to be uh, uh, environmental friendly. Likewise, we also have been looking into the entire construction systems, like uh, we are using some of the digital fabrication right now. Everything is done met, uh, uh, manually in Bhutan. We are introducing some new technology. Now, from the findings earlier, also found out that, that the feeling of the building environment is not uh, good in Bhutan, so the, which means like windows and door elements. So we are also setting up the entire uh, a production system to develop our own uh, uh, windows and door fabrication in Bhutan and then at the same time train the local to, to do both the production as well as installations. We are even doing our 3D printing modelings uh, of these through the plastic recycled. So basically it's overall that uh, 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 we're looking into and this is something that now we are gearing to, to set up and then uh, train the locals and then uh, 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 use it come house uh, to, to install all these things. So with the, hopefully with this, it can uh, uh, safeguard the environment. We can use the local abundance uh, resources and develop the local skills so that we can also generate employability. So this is overall that uh, we are now uh, confining it. And now we, uh, over post COVID-19, then we are ready to construct the come house. Nepal community, we are a, um, a innovation led community hub based in Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. Um, we've been uh, in this space since 2016. Um, were incubation, business incubation, focusing on startups and SMEs uh, is um, our flagship program, but apart from the incubation, we also have a co-working co space. We uh, uh, lease out our training hall for different events. I mean, because we're a community hub that is based around innovation. So we're really open to innovators, change makers, entrepreneurs, artists, activists. So we really kind of uh, work with different people to try and bring, um, to try and look at innovation from different lenses and from the perspectives of different people, right? So that's how uh, it kind. Of, that's how it also is a co-working space. We have community events. We tend to do an eclectic sort of uh, program. So apart, like I said, in addition to the incubation, the co-working space, uh, we also host programs. So one of the programs that we hosted in 2019 was the American Arts Incubator. We had an American artist. Uh, with us for a little over a month and she ran workshops around digital fabrication uh, which would then help women's empowerment so we had um, a group of really charismatic Nepali um, women and men sort of working on uh, women empowerment issues and kind of visualizing it uh, in the art space. And apart from that, we have, uh, we finally have the first fab lab in Nepal, the digital fabrication lab in Nepal, they're with us. We're super excited. I don't come from uh, the engineering background, but coming from a management side, I see so much of potential that fab lab has for uh, the entrepreneurial community here in Nepal. Yes, it's in Kathmandu right now, but hopefully uh, with the situation improving, we get more people interested, more communities uh, interested in the work that Fab Lab is doing. Um, uh, so yeah, we're really excited that we have it here and we've got all these really cool machines. I mean, uh, I did my PhD in an engineering um, department in the manufacturing institution. So I'm like really excited to have these machines and it's just sort of a new learning um, chapter really. Yeah, so uh, currently what Nepal Community does is we run a business incubation program that is generally that runs from 10 months to one year. But uh, but we have we kind of curated and customize it based on the requirement of the project and the enterprises. So the Tourovation Hub specifically is uh, is actually an 18 months project. So the first part of it start, began with an inception study to just understand what's happening in the renewable energy sector and what uh, do tourism enterprises need right now, right? I mean, apart from COVID, also there are challenges in terms of sustainable innovation, infrastructure, 
culture, transport around tourism. And we are a tourism hub. Tourism is our one of our largest uh, industries that um, employs a lot of people. Um, uh, so yeah, so in that sense, like, so what this program, what EC Mode envisioned is how can we support these enterprises to become more resilient, more climate resilient to be more specific, right? So, and then based on this premise, we started off with an inception report to understand talking to different stakeholders across the public and the private sector uh, to look at challenges and opportunities. So it commenced with that. Then we moved on to a six months incubation program, which comes to an end uh, in May, this month really. Um, and then what happens is so we are currently incubating uh, eight enterprises right now so we don't do it in like large numbers because it's also to do with the quality and the kind of support so we did have a selection process where we use the design thinking pro uh, approach to really select these enterprises so we had uh, two three-day design sprints uh, in uh, September and October um, where from where we selected eight enterprises because the whole premise is to start off with what their renewable uh, solution is and to see how it kind of fits into their business model right so we kind of started off with that in the ideation phase and then now in the incubation phase these eight companies we meet with them so in terms of what you were referring to operations wise uh, we meet them uh, for coaching sessions and monthly master classes. So the coaching sessions are really two uh, business coaching sessions and one financial coaching session. And then once a month, there's always a topic that's most relevant to them that we run a half day workshop. And usually it tends to be um, a full day workshop, but because of COVID, uh, our entire program is now virtual for yeah. innovation, mm -hmm. uh, but we've been, we're learning along with uh, helping the enterprises. So that's the incubation phase. From the incubation phase, the eight enterprises then go, the, uh, out of the eight, four will go into the accelera uh, acceleration phase, right? So these are SMEs, sorry, I should have highlighted, but for this cohort, we are working with SMEs. With our other cohorts, we tend to work with startups. Uh, more so early stage startups. Um, uh, so yes, so now four will move into the acceleration phase where we'll help them find investment and then we provide them with post-investment coaching and the program wraps up in December at a uh, Green Tourism Expo where Amazing. all the eight enterprises mm -hmm. come and talk, yeah. What we have been learning about helping the tourism enterprises become more climate resilient is one is the adoption of renewable energy solutions, right? Both at the energy production and the uh, consumption side of it, because it is there is a lot of information, there is support, but it's not really out there for uh, a lot of tourism enterprises. So I think some way to, in terms of to facilitate, um, to help organization understand that renewable energy solutions are not limited just to light right because right now there is also uh, if I may say so a perception that uh, oh it's only for lightning right the renewable energy sources are only for li uh, lightning but that's not it and given that some of the enterprises that we work with are in uh, a mountainous terrain it is important to kind of um, sort of uh, work through this uh, perception and say, no, it can be used for more, right? Uh, the other thing is the use of plastic also, when we're talking about single use plastic bags and bottles, which is a lot of, uh, creates a lot of um, sort of environmental uh, consequences for some of these companies and kind of uh, around waste management, right? So this is more within the climate resilience part of it. And I think in terms of interventions, so hubs like the Turovation Hub is, is important uh, because it supports tourism enterprises to then design these re resilient business models that integrate renewable energy solutions, right? Because it's, yes, it's great to say that, oh, let, let's mm, have all these enterprises adopt renewable energy solutions, but what kind of solution do they need? What kind of uh, re renewable energy actually works for them? Is it solar? Is it wind? Um, there's a lot of uh, also importance around water filtration systems in uh, a lot of the places that our enterprises are uh, working in so that's it so how can incubators like us we are at a nascent stage in nepal where incubation comes but we are slowly working uh towards kind of taking it out of Kathmandu. also it's very Kathmandu centric so we are hoping that there will be incubators across nepal in, yes. the, uh, in the different provinces right and the other key thing is really access to finance for uh, scaling up 
and for innovating climate resilient enterprises, right? There are some um, impact funds around. The banks are really uh, keen on supporting uh, enterprises, not only tourism uh, in the sector, but agriculture and others um, to support it. But yes, I think it's also this kind of making all of this information much more accessible and visible is also one of the other challenges. And I think collaboration, what we've learned um, from our experience in work, uh, through working in the incubation space is it's really important, right? Because we as an yes. incubator, mm -hmm. We really need, we have our expertise, but at the same time, we need sector experts working with us. Um, really, this knowledge sharing is crucial. Yes. And I think mm -hmm. with EC Mode and Salco Foundation supporting what we've seen, how uh, fundamentally it can be and how we can always sort of seek our partners. And we have a steering committee. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. There are people of, uh, representing from the private and public sector here in Nepal who are supporting us. So yes. we see that that also mm -hmm. as a great, as a very important element to be taking this work uh, further in Nepal. Yeah. Our last conversation is going to take place between Renata Avilla and Paola Villarreal, who are both thinking about the future of our cities, our data within those cities, and how we can govern both. I'm so excited to welcome them both to the Open Tech and Design Summit. Hi, Paula. Hi, Renata. Thank you so much for joining me for this session. It's great to see you both. Thank you, Geraldine. Hi, Renata. How are you? Hello. Paula, I would like to begin by learning a bit more about your recent work. You have such a wealth of experience. If and I'm correctly informed, you already started working with the city of Mexico at the age of 17. So it's safe to say that you've been on this journey for quite some time to, to see how can we shape the governance of the cities that we want in future. Can you give me a little bit of an insight into where you think things are currently at, also perhaps in light of the current situation with the pandemic in regard to data management on a city, but also perhaps on a national level in Mexico? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so yeah, I, I've been working at, uh, with Mexico's government uh, at the National Council for Science and Technology, where we developed a project uh, that coordinated many different uh, researchers and scientists with the, the only obje objective to provide information for decision makers. Uh, so they could make better decision or, or, or more informed decision decisions. Um, and this was a very successful uh, project uh, that provided uh, very useful information to, to the health ministry in particular, uh, regarding, for instance, uh, mathematical projections of the behavior of COVID, uh, but also we created uh, different uh, indices for vulnerability in different municipalities across Mexico and different cities, of course. Uh, and yeah, we, we collaborated with many different local governments uh, on the implementation of this information uh, on, the, on the local level. So yeah, it's, it's been super interesting. And I think um, now that we are seeing the end of the, of the tunnel or the light at the end of the tunnel, um, I, I think that we, we need to, to start to focus on, on the cities or, or the lives of people on the cities after the pandemic. So I think that's... Can you say what are some of the topics that you think we want, to, we need to start working on now in order to perhaps build the infrastructures or the frameworks to get the settings right? Yeah, I think um, in terms of public policy, I think 
uh, mobility and public space should be uh, refocused. Uh, and uh, in many cities we have uh, very different, uh, you know, like, um, as public spaces now after the, the, the pandemic with restaurants going outside and stuff like that. But in terms of uh, technology, I think um, for many different companies and many organizations, the pandemic meant that people went more online and the, the, the behaviors uh, changed uh, and how you communicate with people and why you communicate with people online uh, changed. Uh, so we need to, to think about that uh, and, and to, to perhaps prepare in case um, these behaviors change, right? Like maybe perhaps, I don't know, like per perhaps people just want to go outside instead of, uh, you know, like uh, using the internet. Uh, but I don't know, like uh, it's going to be a super interesting time. To, to see how technology or, or what's the impact of technology on, on our lives. Yeah, I feel like um, we're at a, I mean, it always kind of feels like it's a transition point <laughs> for the last 20 years at least, but yeah. the sort of race at the moment, because at least this is how I observe the situation in Germany, big tech corporations have been making city politics and data politics on their own grounds. And due to their really strong lobby powers, which I feel you can feel on a state and on a federal level in Germany quite strongly, are creating facts. So mm -hmm. whilst governments and civil society are still trying to figure out how to form a new social contract, especially when it comes to sharing data on a city level, the big corporations are kind of creating facts along their rules. Um, I know that's something that you're also mm -hmm. thinking about and working on, Renata, um, what it, maybe your thoughts on that, and also how where do we have opportunities to come in on this? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned about uh, a trend that I see, which is uh, more surveillance, of course. Like um, in Mexico, for instance, uh, there uh, there was a recent approval of a uh, how do you say that? Like uh, they ask you to to provide your fingerprint and your iris, and uh, so you kind of in case you want to obtain a, a phone number, right? Like you, you, uh, in case you want to have a contract, you need to provide those uh, pieces of uh, information to the government. Uh, there is no, no way to know what, what's going to happen to that data. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's super, super concerning. And um, I really wish that uh, we have a more, uh, open policy type of, of government, right? Like uh, where we know what's exactly going to happen to that information and it's discussed uh, with experts and, and communities because I also think that uh, in this, uh, like because of the pandemic, because we are in an emergency, right? Like in, in some cases, governments have um, used that as an excuse to stop discussing issues with communities and. Uh, and with experts, right? Like uh, they say, hey, we are in, a, in an emergency, we're going to fast track this law because we need it for security purposes or for health purposes. Um, and that's it, right? Um, so I think we need to, to start looking at, at the, you know, like the outcomes of the pandemic, not only in terms of health, but also in terms of uh, surveillance uh, of, and the impact of technology in general uh, mm -hmm. in our societies. Renata, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to share that uh, Paola is part of an initiative and also part of is the Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms. And something that we, our big focus right now uh, there has been social protection. And, you know, like, uh, how can, is, it, is there any window where AI or automation or like, you know, these big data sets can do anything good for the people? And if it's not, how can we expose this, you know, absence of the pieces? But while studying that, I started like looking at all North and South, what was going on. And to be honest, I think that the trend, I mean, I think that the division more than mean the global North and the global South at this point is the private sector and the public sector. And, and so, so many times that, that, that debate is neglected because 
many, I, I think that we are in a transition period where working for the government is like a bad word. And the best mm. minds of our generation are like dedicating and devoting their minds to build the, yet the next uh, internet startup that will be eaten alive uh, by Silicon Valley, basically, or by the, its equivalent in, in Europe, uh, in China. And so all this innovation goes to that, to that place, basically. And nobody, nobody is innovating in the, in the public sector except exceptional people dedicating, putting their hearts on it because there's no option, there's no private option. So I think that I will, I will actually like, you know, uh, us to turn our, our heads on what happened to even the most developed countries because I, I hate that, you know, like we always like do this artificial division of uh, developing countries and developed countries where I, when, when we come to technology used by the public sector, sometimes the, the so-called developing countries have like this, like, you know, science fiction, science fiction, like co control and monitoring centers that are like with the edgy technologies to surveil and control as Paola described. And, and uh, so in, in that line, what I, I observed during the pandemic and during this time is the rapid privatization of the public sector via digitization. So uh, I think that I think that the, there was a complete, complete opportunistic takeover by private com corporations of functions that go at the core of the public function. Uh, um, health, health monitoring systems, health management systems, uh, you know, the, the systems to monitor the movements of people like uh, emergency control centers, like all each and every Silicon Valley company was ready to jump in and offer this series of techno solutionism that Evgeny Morozov like uh, describes very well uh, uh, in packages to Europe, even you know, like to Europe, to Latin America, everywhere, and so many times for free, and so many times for free, just to get ahead and to get data. exactly all the data they want, and not only the data, but it is it is beyond the data because it is privatizing infrastructure so to create dependence. Basically, they are giving the gram of cocaine mm -hmm. to the governments to keep them addicted, you know? And we're seeing and that so, so strongly right now, of course, in the health sector, the whole debate about patents and vaccines and everything attached to that. Um, but also, in, in general, across all sectors, the stronghold of the idea that this is the only way that innovation can happen, otherwise the world is going to stagnate and stop, yeah? And how do we then break that open, that, that really, narrative? There, there's a very good experience, and it's Mexico's experience. And I don't want to be, or to sound nationalistic, but um, in, in the, at the government of, of, of Andrés Manuel López Obrador, um, we decided that we wanted to build the capacities inside the government with public officials, right? Like I was, I, I no longer work uh, at Mexico's government, but I, I was a, a, a public official uh, and I created a team with public officials, right? And, and the researchers and scientists I, I mentioned were uh, scientists from public uh, research centers, right? So I, I also think that uh, in this case, we were very successful at uh, strengthening the public uh, sector, right? And, and, and I think this experience uh, proves that uh, you can innovate inside government. It's hard. It's super, super hard. But um, with dedication and, and with uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, like uh, strategic thinking, and uh, technical capacity, I think it's quite possible to, to, to know it. And uh, I wish that other countries also have uh, this type of experience, especially um, and especially countries in, in, the, in the global south. And I think it's, it, it's one of the keys why Mexico has been, in, uh, to, to an extent, uh, successful at um, controlling the pandemic, right? Yeah, I think that's a really good example. I guess there are like sort of glimpses of hope, of hope in different places of the world and ex things happening in Taiwan or perhaps also in Toronto or perhaps in a small way in Europe and Barcelona give like a little bit of an idea of how it could be done. 
Um, but again, I feel like we're in this race at the moment. Uh, we're currently devising our smart city strategy for the city of Berlin. And I think the crunchy points are only gonna be ahead of us when it really comes to redefining some of the contracts that exist of how the city gets to access infrastructure data and other data that is currently completely privatized with very little understanding of why it should be public good. I, I would like to add to that, you know, like it's, it's very important to, you know, oh, there was a trend uh, 10 years ago, even more of uh, participatory budgeting Mm. Uh, in Brazil and Latin America, different places, we did experiments. And it was this very intense thing of democrat, the democracy. And the person who writes or the rules of uh, how you acquire the services is the one holding the power. It's not necessarily the mayor even, he's the one, you know, writing the specific cases. There's a lot of power in procurement guidelines. And, and that's what we are like looking into at Women at the Table, you know, and, and then this APOS Alliance initiative on how to rewrite those rules. But I will go one step further, you know, like we need to involve people. When you are deciding um, technology interventions at the city level, I think the citizen participation, the people who will be affected by that technology should be a part of the conception of the initiatives. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and you know, the, there's this frame that we have been working on called the tech we need. And it's, it's like, it's very simple, you know, it's nothing fancy. It's, Putting in the in the writing in the procurement rules that before any decision goes ahead, even if before the, the program is approved, a little bit like when you build a new park or build a new building in a neighborhood, you call the people in the community, you sit down with them and you tell them, you know, like this is what we want to do. This is the system that we need, want to build. And people will have a say, will have a say on that. And when you consult with the people affected, you say like, Okay, and what uh, you explain which data you are getting and why and what for, and then they will ask, but why do you need to collect that kind of thing? Yeah. You know, like it's it's a it's a pro collaborative process, and it uh, well, at the end of the day we need to remember that they are the people we need to serve, and and that's what is the, that's the difference point, the different the differentiated point with the with the private sector. That's one thing, and the other thing is we need to be very, very, very cautious on designing and deploying, deploying technology for emergencies. I think that we need to go back a little bit, like, you know, be a little bit nationalistic on it, because I think that the relaxation when an emergency happens and the deployment of this emergency tech that then it is like the default tech is very dangerous. I'm very worried at the moment with uh, public education and the platforms that everybody started using on it. You know, the data mining on children, uh, it, it has been unbelievable. And it, it belongs to, in many places, to cities to regulate that. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, we saw a lot of that here because we don't have public infrastructure that works in place. People fall back to things like corporate solutions that are not really conform and, and then of course we have very strict data uh, regulation. So there's a huge conflict between the platforms that exist that are possible to use and the broken public sector platforms that might be data conformed but cannot be used. So again, it's this kind of race to create public sector infrastructure and public sector information innovation that we need before all these systems are sort of presented to us by big tech and it's too easy to get, too hard to get out of their lockout situation perhaps. Um, to close with, you've already mentioned some of the initiatives that you're currently working on to think these concepts further. I know we're all busy thinking about things like we were talking about data sharing treaties, about tiered access for communities, for public good. Maybe to close with, what are some of the other key things you're thinking about to bring us to that more desirable future and some of the initiatives you're currently working on? Yeah, uh, I think one of the key issues that uh, we must put attention in is the, um, the algorithmic justice. Like how do we use algorithms uh, in the criminal justice system in many places around the world? And this touches uh, with what Renata was saying about, um, you know, like uh, involving communities uh, that are going to be affected uh, by these algorithms on the design of the algorithms th themselves. And I think this is super, super important because uh, in many cases we are seeing uh, systems being developed by people from 
you know, India uh, and being deployed in Latin America, right? And of course, the, the, the programmer from India doesn't have uh, the context or the local context uh, of people in Latin America. So I think it's very, very important that uh, we are more inclusive and more open to collaboration and to also being able to um, to implement uh, global technologies in a local context. Uh, and that's, uh, I will go a step uh, further uh, to what Renata was saying, and it's not only communities, but it's also, also um, programmers and, and and systems developers, right? Like, uh, I think it's very important that um, that the systems that affect us are built in our local context. And I, I also think that uh, this is a very good opportunity to strengthen the pub, uh, the public sector uh, uh, and and to to reinforce uh, the debate, uh, public versus private, right? And, and uh, I really believe that um, these types of systems should be developed by the public sector, right? by governments um, uh, that have uh, accountability and are, uh, you know, like governed by laws. Because if we uh, give access to companies that provide us with a black box algorithm, we lose a lot of control and we lose a lot of uh, accountability. And in the case of the criminal justice system, this means, for instance, that uh, a judge can say, hey, I didn't decide uh, if you went to jail or not. Uh, it was the algorithm. Uh, so they will renounce their accountability, right? And, and they will excuse uh, themselves and, and you know, like say it was the algorithm and we cannot as a society, and I think we can all agree on that, that to uh, uh, allow that. So yeah, that, that's that's one thing I, I'm, I'm currently yeah, I thinking think about. Yeah, it would be interesting to see what happens in Europe on that front in regard to the proposal that uh, Margarita Vestaga just put out and uh, the plans to control AI that way that are far reaching in some way, but not really in others. Renata, anything to add from your side that you're currently thinking about and working on? Oh yes, oh yes, I have a I have a wish list. You know, please. Like, uh, um, you know the green fen green feminist tech new deal. Basically, I want these systems to be inclusive by design, feminist and green by default. I want the best minds of our generation and, the, and those to come to go back to the public sector. And, you know, like replace the, you know, like the skeletons that are li living skeletons inside or help the people really working on the, on the really harsh conditions that the austerity measures imposed on us in the last 20 years had generated in the pu uh, public sector. Get it back. It is ours. It is the only space that we count on, basically. I want those in charge of budgets to fund it properly, you know, like I want to have a, a job in the public sector that recognizes my preparation, my education and my effort and intelligence. And I want that to be like a, a movement across, not, let's not say North and South, across as many democratic cities as possible. And then uh, growing bottom up, you know, like uh, I, I want this collaboration to be open source, to be free, uh, free software by default, of course, and but more than just sharing the code, sharing the practices and learning from the differences is uh, going to be key. And I want all like, you know, really make it diverse in, in that sense, you know, like, and, and that's a dream. And I hope that we can make it through. And I hope that next year, you Republica people, we can sit down and have a longer conversation about it with Paola and Geraldine. Thank you. I would love that so much. And I share this dream, Renata. Thank you so much for voicing it so on point. I, yeah, I know it's going to be a long haul, but I look forward to working towards this dream together with the two of you. And thank you so much for being part of Republica this year. I do hope that we can share a stage together and welcome you in Berlin next year. Thank you so much. I'm very nice meeting you. Bye. Bye bye. bye.
And that brings us to the end of our program, the end of the Open Tech and Design Summit, brought to you by the Global Innovation Gathering and the Distributed Design Network of Europe. I hope you've enjoyed our program, and I very much look forward to welcome you back tomorrow morning when I will be hosting Republica 21 with the wonderful Julia Kloiber together for you. So I hope you have a lovely evening and see you tomorrow morning for Republica 2021.